Hello and welcome to From Rewatch with Love, a James Bond cinematic rewatch podcast. My name is Graham Stark. Joining me is Matt Wiggins. Hello. And today we are looking at 1979's Moonraker, which is a very silly film. It sure is. <laughs> it's sure something. <laughs> At the end of The Spy Who Loved Me, it said that James Bond would return in For Your Eyes Only, but then Star Wars did very well, and they thought, nah, 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 James Bond goes to space. Made for a budget of $34 million in 1979, which is more than the first eight Bond films combined. Yeah, what was the previous one? Like, The Spy Who Loved Me didn't have anywhere near that, did it? At 13 and a half. Ah, so we've tripled the budget. Yeah, adjusted for inflation, that's $121 million. All right. However, it made adjusted for inflation, $749 million. It became the highest grossing Bond film of the series up until GoldenEye. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, this is what people wanted out of James Bond in the late 70s. In retrospect, that makes sense, because this is probably the movie that I saw on TV the most when I was a kid. Like, this was the movie that I have. I have a lot of strong memories of this film, I guess I should say. And there's there's just a lot to, like, memorialize in this film, for lack of a better word. <laughs> there's a lot of, like, really standout moments. There certainly are. It's it's. I think it's fair to say that in doing this podcast, Cast, you and I have realized that there are many Bond films that have amazing, memorable, iconic moments and are maybe not astounding as a whole. Yes. Uh, this is definitely the most recent. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness not a lot to talk about from the production end of things lewis gilbert returns again as the director much of the same production team this would be the last bond film that ken adams would work on and i'm glad he got an opportunity to the cinematographer cloud renoir had to retire after basically losing his eyesight like we talked about last episode so jean tournier became the cinematographer and the cinematographer is overall not as exciting. It's much more sort of traditionally shot over the course of it. In fact, I would say the most exciting shots in this movie, the most interesting visuals were either shot by second unit director John Glenn or miniatures director Derek Meddings and not the actual sort of overall cinematographer for the movie. Right. Screenplay by Christopher Wood, who co-wrote The Spy Who Loved Me with Richard Maybaum. So now is doing it by himself on this one. And the big sort of change was that the UK put different tax law into place. I'm not entirely sure on what happened exactly, but there was different taxes surrounding movie production. So after constructing the 007 stage at Pinewood Film Studios mm -hmm. for, for the last movie, they went, screw that, we're going to France. <laughs> So this is this is the only movie. Well, they didn't. It's not that they didn't use it. They did use Pinewood Film Studios for the special effects team, but most of the photography was shot primarily in France and then on location in Brazil and Guatemala and the U.S. But right. they, the big sets they built on sound stages in France, they basically because <laughs> this there's a lot of money in the James Bond films, and France was like, yeah, come on down. We've got great tax breaks, and they said, okay, but we need every sound stage in Paris and. France went, sure. And other French movie producers went, what the hell? <laughs> Zutelo or whatever. You know, they were they were not perhaps thrilled with the James Bond team. But I assume that that all worked out after the fact because they did eventually continue shooting in Pinewood. Right. I have nothing else to add before we start talking about this movie. Let's just roll right into it. All right. The pre-title sequence is a real banger in terms of, well, I guess it starts. I'm already mentally getting ahead of myself. The pre-title sequence begins... <laughs> with a space shuttle being transported on an airplane, a pretty cool miniature. Mm -hmm. And there's these secret compartments in the airplane open up, revealing two guys in black outfits who are sort of like, oh, I guess we got to get to work then. And they climb up the ladder into the actual space shuttle and launch it. <laughs> like they they <laughs> steal the space shuttle from the back of this airplane the people in the airplane are like wait what's going on and the space shuttle hits ignition flies off the airplane the booster rockets for the space shuttle just completely destroying the plane and then it flies
flies away and then we just cut hard to M on the phone going well what the <laughs> they they did what and in a scene very similar to the beginning of the last movie M walks over to the door to money penny's office opens it and asks money penny where bond is and i can't remember exactly what humorously sexual quip she leads with this time something about he's getting a leg up or something and then he, it cuts he's to on bond. the last leg on the last leg of his mission and it cuts to bond that's right feeling up someone's leg right yeah it's almost exactly the same m and money penny scene as last movie and that is not the last time i will be saying this is very similar to the spy who loved me <laughs> yeah you're right there are a lot it's funny because like we talked about how the spy who loved me was in many ways almost like a retread of you only live twice yeah and in different ways, this treads a lot of the same ground as The Spy Who Loved Me. Yes. Yeah, you're right. One thing that I just find interesting, it's just a question that I, I only ever think of it when I'm actively watching this movie. Mm -hmm. And then the moment I stop watching this movie, the question exits my brain. <laughs> so I just looked it up now because I was curious. This movie came out in 1979, correct? Yes. Evidently, the first flight of NASA's actual space shuttle was 1981. Yes. It was supposed to coincide with the release of this movie. They were actually a little annoyed, but they were happy that they got the design correct. <laughs> Because when they designed the miniatures for this movie, it was based on whatever public information was out there, whatever information they could get. Right. They were very happy to later discover that NASA didn't change the design from the one that they made for this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they're remarkably accurate. Yeah. They look just like the space shuttle. And I'm like, man, did we have the space shuttle back in 79? I don't think we did. Only kind of, but not really. Like we <laughs> we didn't, <laughs> the public didn't really have a good idea of what the space shuttle looked like in 1979. Or I mean, not while they were like producing it. I assume when it came out, they, they sort of did. But yeah, this, this was released before the shuttle was actually launched. Yeah. It's kind of wild. It is wild. Anyhow, we... We can carry on it just we, with the scene with the space shuttle being carried on the back of the 747 that that jogged my memory of that question, which, of course, when I watched this the other night went through my head and I was like, hmm. So Bond is making out with a flight attendant on a private jet. It's unclear exactly what's happening. This is, you know, the end of another Bond movie, like we've talked about before. She pulls a gun on him and the pilot gets out of the cockpit. He's wearing a parachute. He hands a parachute to the flight attendant and then he shoots the controls of the plane because they're going to kill Bond in a plane crash, I guess, is the plan. Yep. Now, Matt, in this scene, the style icon, Jimothy Bond, is wearing a <laughs> A white turtleneck and a navy blazer with brass buttons a double-breasted navy blazer with brass buttons gray pants black shoes how does this strike you so it's not the worst I always have a hard time with the navy blazer and gray pants it just makes you look like a security guard <laughs> Like, mall security guard James Bond. But the double-breastedness actually sort of, like, shifts it away from that look. The sort of, like, cream-colored turtleneck is enough of a departure that he carries it off okay. I don't hate this look. All right. Fair enough. I mean, it's not James Bond <laughs> to me, right? It's not right. the like exquisitely dressed James Bond, but like as a look, it's good enough. This is basically casual for him. You know, it's the end of a mission. He's on a private yeah. jet somehow. So he and the pilot get into a fist fight. He manages to throw the pilot out of the plane and then is thrown out of the plane himself by Jaws. Yeah. Where was Jaws? Jaws is not small and this plane is also <laughs> not big. That's an excellent question. And I actually think, because they wanted to bring Jaws back for this movie, I actually kind of wish he hadn't been here for this scene because his reveal later in the movie is so good. Yeah. This is like such a, whoa, holy crap, is that Jaws? Like it's, it comes out of nowhere. It's so quick. And I don't know why he couldn't have just fought with like other random dudes in this sequence. But regardless, Jaws throws him out of the plane. No idea what happens to the flight attendant. We assume she gets away okay. And then Jaws himself wearing a parachute also jumps out of the plane. Because what happens is, and this is honestly an astonishing sequence, Bond angles himself in flight to catch up with the pilot, steal the pilot's parachute, 
letting the pilot just fall away and then he and jaws fight back and forth while they're in free fall much like the base jump in the beginning of the last movie this was sort of like here's our idea we don't start principal photography for another couple months go out and see if we can film this and if we can make it work awesome and if we can't we'll think of something else and so they had two stuntmen bj worth was the stuntman for the pilot and jake lombard was the stuntman for bond and jake lombard has a passing resemblance to roger moore allowing them to get some pretty convincing shots in this scene like there are a lot of cut-ins of rear projection stuff which are less convincing certainly to the modern eye but there are a couple shots in here where it's like that's definitely the guy in the air and it kind of looks a bit like roger moore yeah this took them 88 jumps oh wow yeah because they could only get about 60 to 70 seconds of free fall for each thing. And they talk on the DVDs about the camera because it's like, how do you film that, right? They're filming in anamorphic, right? They're in super Panavision widescreen. In the age of GoPro, this seems so quaint, but this is 1979. (laughs) How do you get a film camera to do this kind of photography in that era? The weight alone is astronomical. And what ended up happening is I think it's Michael Wilson, one of the producers, was in like a used camera shop and there was this like cabinet of curiosities in which was an experimental plastic panavision anamorphic lens which drastically reduced the weight of the whole camera rig and so they built like the special effects team built this like miniaturized camera body using this plastic panavision lens so that the photographer could have this like seven pound thing on his head because the other problem is it's like okay you can sort of get it where it's if it's on your head you can sort of do it but then when you pull your shoot (laughs) the like whiplash (laughs) of the cameraman pulling their shoot would just pop his head off if he was wearing too heavy of a camera so this like lower camera and he like did a thing where he had to like brace the camera when he pulled his shoot and was a whole was a whole thing they actually it was they had to put a rope around the shoot that would slow the opening reduce how quickly the cameraman's shoot would open so that it wasn't as abrupt right so that he doesn't just gwen stacy himself yeah exactly and you know if you're if you're looking for it it's pretty obvious that the two stunt performers have slimline parachutes under the jackets they're wearing yes actually my favorite hidden piece of equipment in the scene is the actor who is doing bond everybody else has like helmets and goggles Mm -hmm. but the stuntman for bond of course doesn't because bond got thrown out of a plane with no equipment if you're watching it in hd you can see that he's wearing a pair of like fully transparent goggles where like even the rims around them are transparent so that you can't like see it on his face but you can catch the little glint of the light off it oh i missed that actually that's really cool but yeah this um, there's some just amazing shots in here of them both with one hand on the parachute pinwheeling end over end as they as they fall and it's it's pretty spectacular amusingly the shoot they're fighting over was a not a real parachute (laughs) so at the end of the sequence the stunt performer who then steals that parachute and puts it on then has to take that shoot off (laughs) 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 <laughs> to then use his real shoot. Right. It says apparently the stunt performer would sometimes have to put that on three times, put it on and take it off in a single jump. I mean, with 88 jumps, it took them five weeks to film this sequence, but it's amazing. I can't imagine what, like how amazing this would have looked again in 1979 when we're not just so used to seeing random extreme GoPro footage of people doing skydiving. Especially the fist fight in the door of the, like the open door of the plane is a scene that you would see in and like lauded as Tom Cruise risks his life for your entertainment. But it's fully a scene that you would see in like a modern Mission Impossible movie. That kind of stunt is what that brand makes its money off of. And this is 1979. It's, oh God, I just did that math in my head. That's 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So yeah, the fight up to where we have covered it is super, super awesome. Yeah. Then, as mentioned, Jaws and Bond fight, and then they get away from one another, and Jaws tries to pull his chute, and it doesn't, it doesn't work. And so then there's kind of an amusing shot of Jaws trying to flap his arms. And then we cut to a shot of a circus. And it's like, what? What's going on here? And then we cut to a wide shot exterior of the circus and Jaws falls 
out of the sky into the center of the big top implied that he also lands on the safety net that we just saw in the previous thing, which obviously would not help a normal person, but we've seen Jaws walk away from being thrown off a train. He's Jaws. Then it cuts to the opening titles sequence with this like animation of Jaws like tumbling down onto the, the circus net. And all of this from the point where he pulls his uh, his shoot and it fails to this point is all set to the backdrop of circus music. Yeah, it, it's it's not... I don't it's love it. It's just very silly. <laughs> it's very silly. It's very, very silly. It it definitely sets the tone for this movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that that is undeniable. Yes. <laughs> that was the the pre-title, and now we roll into the titles. Yeah, which is the song "Moonraker," performed by Shirley Bassey with her third outing. It is, and I'm I'm gonna just lead the the way on this one. Okay. Back when we did "Diamonds Are Forever." Right. You made a comment to the effect of when you combine John Barry and Shirley Basie, it's tough to go wrong. I would like to enter this song (laughs) into evidence as exhibit A of that not being true. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's uh, the song doesn't know what it wants to do. Yeah. It doesn't know if it wants to be a belter or a ballad. It definitely ends up as a ballad. Yeah. It's sort of also. Okay. So fun piece of trivia. What's a Moonraker? <laughs> In the movie. In the movie is the name of the space shuttle, right? Yeah. But it's like, you you made that up. What What is that? It's the top most sail on some sailing ships. Okay. Right? Because it's like, it's so high up on the mast that it, you know, it rakes the moon. Okay. Right. So you're reaching for the stars. Right. But in the context of this song, she's singing about like a person, just like the moonraker goes in search of his dream of gold. I search for love for someone to have and to hold. Just like the moonraker knows his dream will come true someday. I know that you are only a kiss away. Amusingly, if you look up moonraker definition right now, the top result is one of like, you know, like a foolish man or something, which is not, it's like, that's a recent thing, possibly because of this movie. <laughs> really? I don't know. Like it's everything that I was looking up was like a square sail flown immediately above the sky sail on the royal masts of square rigged sailing ships. Okay. The, the equivalent sail, if triangular, is called a skyscraper. So I don't know where this other like colloquial definition of a simpleton is coming from. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, she's singing about this sort of like idealized fantasy man that she's in love with. That seems to be the basis of the majority of this song. She is comparing her quest for this fantasy man to things that moonrakers do. There's your song. Lyrics by Hal David, by the way, who's shown Mm -hmm. up several times. And people thought we were really unusually down on Diamonds Are Forever, too, because we rated it so low. (laughs) I think it's a good song. I just don't think it's as good as a bunch of the other songs. Yeah, but this one I just don't like as much. (laughs) (laughs) This one's just, yeah, it's not very good. And the visuals behind it don't redeem it at all. No, no, the visuals of the opening titles. Man, that the silhouette shot of roger moore hanging from the parachute thing it's just it's all jowl it's not a good shot oh yeah the turtleneck makes it look so much worse yeah there's some like weird superman shots of nude women flying around there's like some interesting shots of like hair with cool lighting but yeah the the opening titles visually fairly uninspired just like a lot of trampoline flips and stuff yeah and then it fades back into M's office at the end. It's not as jarring as The Spy Who Loved Me going from the skiing base jump to Nobody Does It Better, but it is kind of a after the yeah. opening title sequence. I was okay. So I think the reasons this one doesn't totally evaporate the film's energy as badly as it did in The Spy Who Loved Me mm-hmm. is because there is the like the transition. It's not just like Bud opens his shoot and gets away and then fanfare and then ballad. We have the transition through the circus. Awesome stunt then comedy bit Mm. then we use the comedy bit to transition into the song and the song just sort of like coasts that yeah that's fair but it's not nearly as stark they dissipate the hype before the song even starts we'll figure out the ranking for that later i suppose moving right along so in m's office 
Q and Frederick Gray are waiting. Bond arrives. Money Penny tells him that he's late. And he says, well, I fell out of a plane. And she doesn't believe him. And he's like, all right, well, whatever. He goes in and M is a little annoyed that he's running late. Introduces Frederick Gray again, who I mentioned first appeared in The Spy Who Loved Me and would continue to appear in several more movies going forward. He's the minister of defense that's correct i knew that haha the three of them fill bond in on the setup here's what's going on with the movie the moonraker space shuttle which belongs to the states was being loaned to england for to do space stuff (laughs) it's not actually specified is it or is it no i assume it's like research and testing and sure and to like support their own space program and then the plane transporting it and the moonraker itself both crashed somewhere in alaska in the middle of the flight at least that's the story the press says q shows on a cool mirror that retracts into a tv screen that all they can find at the crash site is the plane and absolutely no wreckage of the moonraker itself meaning someone literally stole the space shuttle from the back of the plane which is what we saw happen. So yes, that that is what occurred. Bond needs to figure out what the hell's going on. The plane was built by Drax Industries in California, and so that's where he should start. Let's see what they might know about it. Mm-hmm. It's weird, because it's like, he starts almost being suspicious of Drax, when you almost shouldn't be, right? It's like, yeah. who could have stolen this? Okay, well, it was built here, so go there and, I don't know, see what they can tell you about the space shuttle. But Bond is immediately going in like, ah, I think this guy's up to no good. Now, granted, you look at him for three seconds and you're like, oh, this guy's up to no good. But, you know, <laughs> it, it is a little weird. I, I felt that it was actually a little stronger in the other direction where, I mean, like, Drax has a bit of a malevolent aura. You're right. So you look at him and you immediately go, oh, this guy is the villain and he's up to no good. But as we will see when we get to Drax Labs, I mean, Drax comes out of the gate and is like, kill that man. <laughs> Yeah, he comes off a little strong. (laughs) My assistant will show you around. Then he turns to his other assistant. Make sure he doesn't leave. Like, they waste no time. As I say, I'm jumping ahead. All Drax needs to do when Bond shows up at Drax Industries to look around and get information is cooperate. Sure, here's everything we know. The space shuttle is missing. We don't know where it went. Yeah. And you are, like, completely clear of suspicion. But if a British secret agent shows up at your company and you've got stuff going around in the background where you've been stealing and planning world domination and you want to make sure that you dodge any suspicion of wrongdoing maybe don't immediately murder the british secret agent that's been dispatched to investigate your stuff yeah (laughs) shocking strategy here yeah before bond leaves q gives him a funky little wrist thing it's like a spider-man web shooter basically (laughs) except it fires darts (laughs) I'm just trying to describe it for anyone not watching. It totally is. I I hadn't considered that, but like Q is even Q is even like it it activates based on nerve impulses in the wrist. So just flip your hand back and it'll it'll fire the dart. Go web, go. Yeah, basically, yeah. So he he gives him five darts that are like instant tranquilizers. Like it says like 30 seconds and five darts that are explosive tipped. And he tests one of the tranquilizer ones. He fires it into one of M's paintings, which so it's a painting of King William III of England. And in the movie, The Black Tulip in 1937, the character of King William III was played by Bernard Lee. Oh, yeah. Ah, that's like deep filmmaking lore there. <laughs> that's uh, that's a deep cut. Yeah, I'm I'm so bummed that this is the last time we get to see Bernard Lee. Yeah, I was thinking the other day that there is a startling amount of continuity between supporting characters there there's actually been no actor playing bond who has not had at least one character carry on from a previous bond now granted you've you got desmond llewellyn was in like all of them up until pierce brosnan but pierce brosnan had judy dench playing m and so did daniel craig so is there not a break between license to kill and goldeneye because goldeneye they replace m they replace money penny oh no but they do still have q you got q q's the q's the linchpin to this whole thing right yeah whoever plays bond after daniel craig as long as they keep ray fines around as yes. m of course we haven't seen no time to die at this point assuming he survives though it was pretty startling that m even got into the field at one point you know assuming ray fines continues then that'll hold true 
Yes. Or the Money Penny character or Q. Regardless, in this movie, Bond heads off to California, gets in a Drax Industries helicopter, being flown by Corinne Dufour, played by Corinne Clary, in an impractical shirt, but fine. <laughs> it appears to be standard issue. She's not the, like, their uniforms are just very deep v's yeah and so there's some cool helicopter shots of california and almost imperceptibly a air quotes helicopter shot of a miniature of the moonraker facility where the space shuttles are built it's a really cool miniature it is the the facility is rad i was talking in way back in the dr no episode about how one of the unsung heroes of the series is ken adam i think the unsung hero of this movie is derek meddings because there's so much miniature stuff and it's all awesome <laughs> mm-hmm. I have a soft spot for miniatures, so I, I grant that maybe that's me. No, I'm right there with you. I, I love miniature work in movies. It's so much fun. Mm-hmm. Ms. Dufour explains that Drax, she basically establishes for the audience that Drax is incredibly wealthy. And if he sees something, he wants it. So it's like, you know, he owns all of this. If there's something that he doesn't own it's only because he doesn't want it to the point that they fly further into the california mountains and there is a french villa that was dismantled brought to north america and reconstructed brick by brick of course they filmed it at an actual french villa in literal france but they're pretending that it's in california there's a, a great quip about why didn't he just buy the eiffel tower and have it shipped here and she's like he did but the french denied him an export permit right Which seems like it would definitely irritate someone like Drax. So they go inside this amazing palatial villa. There's a butler who leads him into his meeting with Hugo Drax, played by Michael Lonsdale. Now, I mentioned the production moving to France. And part of the... This is a concept we are very familiar with, being in Canada. Part of the terms of centering your film production in France is that you had to cast some number of French people. So this is why Corinne Clary was cast as Miss Dufour and why Michael Lonsdale, who's actually a French actor who's fluent in English and French, is cast as Hugo Drax, sometimes billed as Michel Lonsdale. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, he was actually born in Paris. And the majority of his movie appearances are French productions. He is wearing the, like go-to James Bond villain uniform of like a high-collared suit. Yes, something that buttons right up to the neck with no tie. Looks like a pair of overalls. Yeah, he's playing the piano. And then he says hello to Mr. Bond and says, before we continue and introduces two women sitting in the room, he's like, before they leave us, let me introduce you to the Countess Whomstever and this other phenomenally attractive woman. They're just leaving. Now, how did you describe Drax at the tail end of the spy who loved me yeah so i know i'm not the only person to have made this observation ever but drax if you if you didn't listen to the last episode i'm gonna ruin moonraker for you drax is just droopy dog (laughs) hello mr bond the entire time i was watching moonraker i was just repeating all of drax's dialogue (laughs) (laughs) You have an annoying habit of staying alive. (laughs) Just the entire time, I was just like, before they leave us, let me introduce the Countess Von So-and-So. Hello, Mr. Bond. Welcome to California. Like, I couldn't stop myself. There's just something about how he, like, carries himself. It Like, he's not helped at all by the costume, right? Like, the costume is part of what sells the, like, the demeanor. But it's impossible not to see it. It once you've had this movie ruined for you <laughs> oh my god oh mr bond you are far too humble how would oscar wilde have put it to lose one <laughs> aircraft may be regarded as a misfortune to lose two seems like carelessness oh my god sorry <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Anyway, it's also the the goatee, right? Yeah, Just, the goatee, the slicked back black hair. Yeah, it's it's he just visual and he's he seems he's the same height as Roger Moore, at least in one of these shots. But he just seems so small, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You've arrived at a propitious moment, coincident with your country's one contribution to Western civilization. Afternoon tea. May I press you to a cucumber sandwich? <laughs> Anyway, oh my god. 
Oh no. Well, it entertains me at least. Anyway, so he he makes this show of throwing a couple pieces of meat to his massive dogs that don't react at all until later in the scene when he snaps his fingers and through sped up footage they rapidly chomp the meat down. Which is a totally normal not evil thing to do. Yeah, especially when it's followed by a not threatening line. Anyway, this, so the thing is, he's <laughs> like, oh, hi, you must be here to apologize on behalf of your government for losing one of my space shuttles. To which Bond correctly says, my government will make an apology to your government whose space shuttle we lost because <laughs> you sold it to the government. It wasn't yours when it went missing, you strange man, is the subtext <laughs> of what he's saying yeah. in this moment. By the way, serving tea, I mentioned that they were having afternoon tea. The man serving tea is Chang, who, for whatever reason, is wearing a full Yukata and Geta number. Chang is played by Toshiro Suga, who was producer Michael G. Wilson's Aikido instructor. Oh! Yeah. This is like one of his only acting credits. He did like a couple other French movies after this. Right. It was mostly just that they were like, we need a guy for this. And Michael Wilson was like, oh, I bet my Aikido constructor could do it. <laughs> and he does. He does. He is a pretty good henchman. Mm -hmm. A little out of place in the scenes he appears, but he's a pretty good henchman all in all. So Drax is like, OK, well, Miss Dufour will show you around the place and we'll be able to answer any questions that you might have. And then he leaves the room and then, yeah, you're you're right. Like he doesn't even it's not even like a will someone rid me of this meddlesome priest kind of thing. It's literally Bond leaves the room. Drax says to Chang, look after Mr. Bond, see that some harm comes to him. Yeah. Why? It seems like you're you're flipping right to 10. Yeah, I'm going to need you to gear down a little bit. So they wander around. Ms. Dufour takes Bond to this amazing office and says, you're looking for Dr. Goodhead. You'll find them in there. Bond goes inside and clears his throat and overwalks Dr. Goodhead, played by Lois Childs, who is, as Bond notes, because he has eyes, a woman. This bothers me, not because it's sexist. It is. It's because we have not up until this movie, which is Roger Moore's fourth movie, seen mm -hmm. any reason for the character of Bond, at least under Moore's era, to be surprised to find a capable woman in a scientific or intelligent position. Yes. And for some reason, he's a real asshole in this scene. Yes, he is. And it's not just like through the entire Roger Moore era to this point, although you're right, it is through the entire Roger Moore era to this point that he would not have reason to react this way. But also during the flyover of the Drax estate, they see all the trainees and it is a racially and gender diverse group of trainees training to be astronauts he's been shown around by a female helicopter pilot at this point the extras we see walking around in the background are like there's nothing about this facility or anything that we've seen so far that indicates that there is a any sort of sexist hiring policy underlying it either like it comes completely out of the blue in the scene yeah he's just like Oh, a female rocket scientist. How quaint. Yeah, it's like she walks up and she's like, I'm Dr. Goodhead. And he makes this facial expression of mild surprise. And I was like, Ugh, OK, but then he just outright goes a woman. And it's like, why would you say that? And, and, and then only later I realized and he wouldn't say that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I I found it like not just bad because it's bad, but bad because it's not in keeping with what we know of Bond. And then later, what is it? What does he say later in the same scene that's even worse? Uh, he says, are you training to be an astronaut? <laughs> right. Yeah, but in a really like patronizing way. Are you training to be an astronaut? Yeah. And she's like, I am an astronaut, <laughs> you piece of garbage. <laughs> like she's, yeah. she's to her credit. To Lois Child's credit, Dr. Goodhead is not putting up with this. Yeah. I am an astronaut, subtext, you effing dinosaur. I am literally on loan here from NASA. Yeah. Barely containing that she's not thrilled to be given this assignment, she offers to show him around. I don't even think that this is Bond trying to put on some sort of character. I think this is just bad writing. Yeah, it looks like he like it does look like he's trying to antagonize her because we have like multiple scenes in a row where he's like trying to antagonize her and she's reacting by like, Ugh. 
but Moore is playing it like he's trying to be charming. Yeah. Like he's just negging her. And she is clearly not receptive to this. She is. She keeps like rolling her eyes at him, basically. But one would think that Bond being here. Now I'm just continuing my rant from earlier. One would think that Bond being here on a quest to like learn information about Drax and about Drax Industries and about the Moonraker shuttle. He would want to ingratiate himself to the people here. Yeah. This scientist that he is speaking to is a literal font of information that might come in handy in terms of determining why somebody would want to steal a shuttle. Perhaps don't be a dick. (laughs) And it's unclear if he even thinks he's being a dick. That's what I find so confusing about this exchange. Yeah, like he's got a very smarmy expression on his face every time he digs at her. As I say, I think he thinks he's being charming, but it does not come off that way, certainly from a modern eye. When they're doing their introductions after that, like, oh, a woman exchange, you know, she calls him Mr. Bond and he extends his hand and says, James, to my friends. And she just sticks her clipboard under her arm to return the handshake and goes, Holly Goodhead, like really deadpan. (laughs) By the way, Lois Childs mentioned in one of the DVD interviews that she loves that she has one of the rudest names of of <laughs> Bond's co-stars. It's so good. Dr. Goodhead takes Bond to the G-Force machine. The centrifuge. Thank you. The centrifuge, <laughs> which is also an amazing set. They they talked about doing it on miniature, but they were like, no, let's just build one because they had all these sound stages across Paris. And they're like, that one has the centrifuge set. This one has this set. She's like, maybe you'd like to give it a try. And he's like, OK, sure, because he doesn't suspect that she wants him dead. So he climbs into the centrifuge up in the control box. Chang comes in, replaces the operator and start turning it up there there's a a brief cutaway of dr goodhead on the phone saying oh yes we're taking care of him in like a threatening way to make the audience think like maybe she's in on this but she isn't what one of the things i like about this scene before before we carry on is that it does give her a chance to dig back at bond because she straps him into the machine and then she like restrains his arms and she's like that's so you don't punch yourself out she's like this here is a chicken switch just if the g-forces get too much for you just let go and you know it Bond is looking a little bit nervous through this and and she's like, we'll take you up to three G's. Don't worry, a 70 year old can take three G's. Roger Moore, by the way, is 51 at this time. Hmm. Yeah. So Chang starts cranking up the g-forces this the scene goes on for some time but basically the g-forces keep getting higher and higher and higher i I, I mean it's just the g-forces get higher the scene goes on for minutes and it's chang slowly turning up the thing and bond can't reach the switch to stop it and eventually remembers and is able to fire off his web shooter missile and blow up (laughs) the mechanics inside the little cockpit that he's in which brings the whole thing to a halt at that point dr goodhead rushes in is like oh god I'm sorry, I don't know what went wrong. This shouldn't have been able to happen. Bond looks up to the control room and Chang is just sitting there scowling at him. Yeah, and so Bond is immediately like, oh, okay, I I understand now that Drax is trying to kill me. Like, what? I don't know. Sometimes we talk about how Bond is really unsubtle in walking into a villain's space and being like, yo, I'm James Bond. I'm going to murder you. What's up? This is like the complete opposite energy. <laughs> mm-hmm. We transition then to nighttime at Drax's villa where Bond is still staying for some reason. Like this is this is what I don't sort of understand is that it's obvious to Bond and to Drax that Drax is trying to kill Bond. Yes. Everyone is on the same page. And yet Bond is still just like, what's up? I'm staying in your villa. Drax is like, okie dokie. I... I (laughs) I'll most likely kill you in the morning. Yeah, exactly. So he lets himself into Ms. Dufour's room in the middle of the night. And she's like, ah, yes, you must be here for the sex. And he's like, no, actually, I wanted information. And she's like, oh, okay, sure. I will just completely flip on Drax and give you all the information. And then Bond is like, but also sex. So they do the sex and then (laughs) he gets additional information and she leads him to Drax's office where his safe is. And he lets himself into the safe, finds some plans for a device that is unclear exactly what it is at this point. But he takes a microfilm of it and leaves. And Chang sees Ms. Dufour leave and sees Bond leave and nothing happens. It's kind of a long sequence, honestly. It is. 
the little cigarette case safe cracking x-ray device that shows up in this scene pretty good mm. oh yeah no fun fun gadgets certainly this movie seems so determined to be a james bond movie that it just barrels forward without stopping to explain why certain things are the way they are why does yeah. drax just go straight to 11 to ask the bond be killed why does miss dufour just go oh okay i'll just spill the beans for no reason sure everything's just jamming on the gas like not that the pace is moving quickly it's just sort of like oh i guess that's we're at that stage of the movie already why why, why, what's happening and it won't slow down this movie does not take a break really no it just goes from set piece to set piece the next one is in the morning drax and a variety of friends of his i guess other guys they're all dressed like english fowl hunters are on a fowl hunt they're shooting ducks and geese that are being drummed up out of the bushes surrounding remember this is supposed to be california (laughs) well it is it is drax's palatial estate i guess they must have like a pheasant farm they're seeding the woods yeah it definitely does not read as california at all in this scene but i'm willing to uh you know he imported part of france maybe he's imported part of england too yeah it's english dirt so drax is there chang is there with the dogs there's two women there also dressed like hunters that are not doing anything there's a pile of dead birds that they've already killed bond is driven up in this amazing old car guy goes up and tells drax yo he's he's here they blow a horn all the other dudes leave they specifically blow the first three notes of the theme from 2001 a space odyssey yes right also sprack zarathustra (laughs) I've never been able to pronounce the name of that song. I'm not even going to try. Anyhow, it is it is an, an explicit reference to 2001. Not the most entertaining movie reference, but we'll get to that. No. Drax introduces these two different beautiful women who then also leave the scene. Bond is like, well, anyway, it's been fun, but I'm going to be taking off. I got all the information I need. Thanks for your hospitality. And Drax is like, well, before you leave, join me for a bit of hunting. Why not? Here you go. And gives him a gun. One of Drax's men is up in a tree with a rifle taking aim at bond they scare up some birds bond tracks it and fires and the bird flies away and drax goes oh you missed and bond goes really did i and the man with the rifle falls out of the tree dead (laughs) and then after the guy falls out of the tree it cuts back to them both just sort of exchanging a meaningful look yeah and the the implication is that bond fully just murdered that dude with the knowledge of drax But neither one of them has yet actually confronted the other about the fact that Drax is trying to kill Bond. So Bond just shoots the dude, he falls out of the tree, and he turns to Drax and is like, did I miss? And then turns around and walks away, leaving Drax to just stew over the fact that one of his hench dudes got shot. Yeah, he hands the gun back to him. Yeah, and he does hand the gun back to him. It's just an incredibly ballsy move on the part of Bond. And then he gets back in Drax's butler's car and gets driven away. Like, there's so many opportunities opportunities for Drax to kill him here. Yeah, driven to the airport. It's so goofy. Ms. Dufour drives up in a little golf cart, which is just adorable. The, the golf cart's great. She says, you wanted to see me? And Drax says, you led James Bond to my study last <laughs> night. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Drax (laughs) confronts her and says that Chang saw her in the study and she's like, what? No, no, I didn't. And he's like, I'm terminating. I'm terminating your employment. Effective immediately. Chang, this is grim. Chang releases the dogs and instead of running to the golf cart, she just runs into the woods and then there's this long amazingly shot this is actually really well shot but this long sequence of her running through the woods being chased by these dogs at the end of which they catch up with her and holy crap she gets torn apart by dogs that's that's awful Yeah, it is. You're right. Grim is a good word for it. It is a long chase and you're just watching this like doomed woman run through the woods until the dogs finally catch her. This looks like a scene from a different movie. 
Yeah, this is my like looking for continuity errors in the scene coming out once again. But you'll notice when she goes to turn around and run into the woods, she's wearing high heels. And then the first shot of her running through the woods is wide enough that you can see she's now wearing running shoes with athletic socks. I didn't notice that, but I'm glad for her ankles that that is the case. As the camera pans away from the grisly scene that is presumably happening off bottom of shot, we hear a bell tolling and that is our transition to Venice. We're back in Venice. Bond pulls up in a gondola to St. Mark's Square. Is that where this is? That's that place in Venice, right? Sure. I assume that Bond Trep visits only famous locations in the locales that he visits. As I have never been to Venice, the only place in Venice I know is St. Mark's Square. I got good news for you. I looked it up. It is indeed St. Mark's Square. All right, good. Uh, For those watching at home, there's a wide shot and you can see a man in a short-sleeved collared light blue shirt walking through foreground, presumably a tourist, that is Cubby Broccoli. Oh! Yeah, in a rare cameo. I see him. There there he is. Cute. Most of the scenes in St. Mark's Square, they just sort of gave up on trying to do crowd control. Right. That they were just like, oh, there's too many tourists and whatever hell with it it's fine because like later on he comes through in a vehicle and it's like uh we ever we want everyone to look at him because it's weird so fine we'll just let we'll just drive through a crowd of tourists it'll be fine <laughs> so bond arrives finds vinini glass which is a glass manufacturer and sort of museum almost because One of his photos that he took of the plans mention Vanini Glass. So he goes inside. There's a woman there who says he can take a look around wherever he wants. So he just lets himself in the back. He looks at where they're blowing glass, just sort of wanders around like the factory floor of where they're making glass. And he notices that there's some sort of glass cylinders that are, I want to say, hexagonal, and they match up with what is being shown on the plans. So he's like, oh, that's interesting. And then like there's like a tour group leading themselves through. Like it's not weird necessarily for him to be back there because like it seems like there's tourists going through the factory floor as well like it seems like a place where you can go and look at amazing glass that's on display and also watch people blowing glass and like it seems like a tourist thing so he goes to an area where there's a bunch of cool glass that's being shown off and there's a tour group going through and among the tour group is dr goodhead and that's unusual that the nasa scientist who's on loan to drax's california operations would suddenly be in venice and also at this benini glass place Mm -hmm. So Bond sort of hides himself from the tour group. The tour guide shows off a particularly fancy and expensive glass bowl and says, but if any of you were thinking of taking it and she like pokes the plinth and then this like alarm sounds and they all have a good laugh. And it's like, oh, that's a strange thing to show off, but cool. This, this whole tour guide situation is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Bond skulking around in the background while this tour guide goes through and is like, look at this priceless piece of glassware. There's nothing else left. Like it on Earth. We believe it's been appraised such that if it were to go at auction, it would go for one and a half million American dollars. Over here, we have the glass handled saber of King Louis the Third. There's nothing like it in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like there in the open. Yeah. Bond notices that Dr. Goodhead is excusing herself from the tour group. So he goes to follow her on the way past the tour guide recognizes him and sort of stumbles over her tour. So obviously this is one of Drax's people. Bond follows Goodhead as she wanders in the back of the building. There's someone coming. So she ducks around and ends up around front of the building. And then he sort of is like, oh, hey, what's up? But she's very surprised to see him. And he pretends like he's just now recognizing her he's like oh look oh dr goodhead hello fancy meeting you here and she doesn't buy it you know he yeah she thinks he's following her he's like well then drinks later like (laughs) (laughs) he's like i'm sure you wouldn't mind dinner and she's like well i'm giving a presentation this evening so dinner is out of the question it's like well then can you can you think of any reason why we shouldn't celebrate afterwards with drinks and she she responds with well nothing's coming to mind but i'm sure i'll think of something I just imagine like what a what a play. I'm not saying it's a good play, but just the can you think of any reason to say no to this? And I just imagine the like for anyone who watches Countdown, I just imagine the clock, you know, and then Bond's like, no, I guess we're going to drinks because you couldn't think of any reason not to in time. God. 
So they agree to drinks. Yeah. They go on their separate ways. Bond goes and gets back into a gondola. It's the same gondola that dropped him off in a different location. Yes. Which is amazing. He knows the the gondola driver by name. So my assumption here is that he's just rented the gondola for the day and it's following him around. This is an MI6 gondola. Oh, yeah, of course it is. Right. Yeah. So an MI6 agent gondola driver, Franco. Yeah. So they start meandering down the canals. Coming towards them is a different gondola, like a funereal gondola. It's all black and there's cherubs on it and black flowers and, and a coffin on top. I don't know if this is a real thing i didn't look it up i i kind of hope it is but even if it's not it's amazing yeah and as it approaches them the coffin opens up the inside (laughs) of the lid of the coffin is lined with knives that are like set into this bespoke pillowed coffin top (laughs) and a rack of different throwing knives comes up out of the coffin and the man in the coffin sits up and picks up a throwing knife and hurls it at the gondola driver who takes it in the chest and dies and it's like what an amazing what an amazing assassin thing <laughs> it's i i unashamedly love this scene oh yeah i love this scene it's so ridiculous who who is this guy where did he come <laughs> from why does he have a bespoke coffin does he always operate by coffin what if he has to assassinate somebody who's not near a canal none of yeah. these questions <laughs> None of these questions are answered, nor do they need to be. (laughs) It's so good. I kill people only by throwing knife and only in Venice. (laughs) And as we learn moments from now, this is extremely impractical for actually navigating anywhere through Venice. It seems to only work basically in this canal yeah because of course he throws the knife at the gondola driver kills him this gives bond a moment to react so he then goes to throw a knife at bond bond sort of dodges the knife misses and as the assassin is going to grab for a third knife bond pulls the knife out of the side of the gondola wings it back at the assassin hitting him in the chest causing him to fall over dead back into his own casket the lid falls on top of him bond then being an mi6 gondola activates the motor that this gondola has evidently had in it all along and starts rocketing off down the the canal in the other direction while it turns out that there's a another goon with like a tommy gun or whatever inside the back of the i'm gonna call it the hearse gondola yeah so he starts shooting bond raises his little bulletproof shield up and while all this is going on the driver of the the hearse gondola has been so caught up in all the the action that's happening he drives into a bridge bridge that bond just passed under as he's driving under the bridge the casket hits the bridge and is swept off the top of the the hearse gondola into the canal we then like cut to a scene of a guy possibly like almost like an uh i don't want to sell you death sticks i want to go home and rethink my life kind of a moment (laughs) as there's a guy like smoking a cigarette hacking up a lung peers over the bridge and sees this casket floating by and then sort of like shakes his head and tosses his cigarette before we cut back to the action scene very odd it's so weird bond of course is in his gondola his motorboat gondola now making his escape more boats like actual normal power boats come out and start chasing him down the canal they've got henchmen with smgs that are shooting at him he manages to to sort of like stay away and evade not before (laughs) causing some serious trouble for a pair of venice bound lovebirds and their gondola driver as uh, as he runs a red light apparently i didn't know this but venice has light controlled intersections on their canals which is cool bond runs a red light which causes the gondola driver to stop his gondola and then the chase boat plows right through the middle of this now stopped gondola in the middle of the intersection the chase moves into open water bond makes his way basically back to saint mark's square where he flips another switch in the gondola the controls change and a skirt deploys underneath it it turns into a hovercraft and he climbs the stairs up out of the water onto land and drives his hovercraft gondola through the middle of the square astonishing onlookers and pigeons alike as we established in diamonds are forever hovercrafts are cool hovercrafts are cool this is a very tacky hovercraft but i love it i love that they were like all right what's roger moore's thing gonna be 
boat chases. We got one in Live and Let Die. We got one in Man with a Golden Gun. You know, like a quarter of Spy Who Loved Me is underwater anyway, so eh, maybe we don't need a boat chase. What's the next movie we're doing? Moon is going to space? Uh, better get a boat chase in there. <laughs> So this is the scene I was talking about where he's driving through St. Mark's Square and they just didn't bother with crowd control because they're like, whatever, people are going to be gawping at the gondola. They're not going to look at the camera. Mm -hmm. And this is where we see that guy again. Drinking from the bottle and like looks up, sees what he sees and does the like, oh God, I got to stop drinking. Look at the bottle. Victor Trujansky again, (laughs) the Italian location (laughs) supervisor. The lone shot in this scene that pushes it from super awesome to like fully jumps the shark is the pigeon double take. I... I hate it. I hate it so much. (laughs) Because it's so clearly just like an editing trick. And like the shot of the dog, because it's there's shots of all these people watching it go by in close up. And then there's a shot of a dog as well. And that would be funny. But they did this thing with a pigeon where they just caught a pigeon turning its head and then like ran the film back. So it goes like, what, 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 what? And it's so obviously just an editing trick. And I hate it so much. (laughs) rest of the scene is great yeah. but yeah they do the silly like music cue again mm-hmm. like it's a big orchestral like upbeat fun it's like the circus music in the opening scene where it, it undermines any degree of tension or seriousness in the scene but the hovercraft gondola is itself so goofy that there's not a lot of seriousness left in the scene but the pigeon double take is overselling the joke yes i agree i do like that the two guys who were chasing him with a gun that nobody seems to notice or care about they do like a dull face and then go to drive away and one of them falls in the water and the one driving the boat doesn't notice and he's just like swearing at him from the water yeah it's now nighttime and bond now disguised as a gondola pilot literally only by wearing a black outfit and a gondolier's hat lets himself back into drax's glassworks so he can do some sneaking around he finds a room inside with a keypad on it and he's about to investigate it when he hears someone coming and there's a scientist you can tell he's a scientist because he looks like a cartoon (laughs) of a scientist. (laughs) He sure does. Whatever you're thinking in your mind as scientist right now, that's what this guy looks like. Yeah, I'm thinking, I'm looking into your mind's eye. You're thinking round Coke bottle glasses, white hair, white beard, short white suit with like a weird pocket protector looking thing. Anyway, so he he walks up to the keypad and types in numbers that emit musical tones, and the tones are do 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 do, <laughs> because Cubby Broccoli asked Steven Spielberg if he could use the tone from Close Encounters as a audio gag in the movie. Yeah, Spielberg said yes, and several years later, Spielberg asked Broccoli if he could use the 007 theme in the Goonies, Yeah, which they did end up doing. Although apparently, jokingly, Broccoli was like, well, there's a lot more than five notes in the 007 theme. (laughs) (laughs) At one point, Broccoli was trying to get Spielberg to direct a Bond film and were actually in negotiations to do it until George Lucas asked Spielberg to direct Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, now I want to see Spielberg's take on a Bond movie. I know, right? (laughs) It'd be very strange. Maybe with the next actor when they course correct back to being goofy again hmm So Bond then uses this newfound knowledge to let himself into the room. I should say, like, the building is, like, old, lots of stonework and paintings. There's, like, a random sideboard with elaborate candlesticks on it. There's chandeliers. He uses the keypad and lets himself in, and in this room is, like, a clean room. There's, like, a science lab with enormous fume hoods and a huge plexiglass tube thing and a big viewing window with rounded corners like it's, you know, this is a they had ken adams design a lab and he was like what if i went with round things instead of angular things that's not me making a supposition that's what he said it's a great lab it like it's super cool yeah but it's sort of like been built inside this room you can just catch glimpses of the edges of like marble columns and stuff that this was just the room they had Mm -hmm. so they built a lab in and in it they're doing Oh, they're doing all manner of science. They're filling little vials with some kind of clear liquid and putting vials into hexagonal canisters and then putting those hexagonal canisters into the hexagonal glass that Bond saw earlier. And then they're putting 
multiple things of the hexagonal glass into these strange dome objects. And then the two scientists wheel one of those things out of the room. So Bond lets himself in. He sort of looks around. He's like, huh, that's a weird thing. He grabs one of the clear canisters, sort of can't quite suss out what it is, pops it in his pocket. And then he hears the scientists about to come back in, just drops the other canister where he was and dashes back out of the room. The scientists go to move the other thing and the canister falls to the ground, breaking open. And the scientists look horrified. The doors seal off, the room fills with gas, and the two scientists immediately and painfully, by the looks of it, die. Mm -hmm. Bond just inadvertently killed a couple of dudes. Oh, Bond does a murder here. It's not on purpose, but Bond fully murders two random scientist dudes. (laughs) But interestingly, and of great importance, is that there is also a cage of rats in the room. I don't know why they're in the room. It actually doesn't make sense for them to be there, but the rats are unaffected. I feel bad for the scientists in this scene. Yeah. We don't know anything about these scientists. The older scientist that we saw walk in, he was three days from retirement. The younger scientist has just taken this job to put his kids through college. (laughs) Like, do they know that they're doing something evil? I mean, they seem to know exactly how lethal the thing they're making is, because as soon as it breaks, they're like, "Uh uh-oh. I guess because of what the pods are and we know, like, we will learn what the pods are, that it's probable that these scientists know what the pods are for. I have to assume that these scientists aren't going, I certainly hope that they'd only use my... (laughs) colorless, odorless, instantly lethal nerve gas for good. Yeah, I don't know. If I'm Drax, this is where... Now I'm now I'm just, like, questioning the construction of the film. If I'm Drax, do I not just hire scientists to formulate a chemical concoction of my own design? And do I not, like, operate my illicit nerve gas manufacturing ring via cells that are independent of one another so that nobody knows the full chain from top to bottom and they are all insulated? That would probably be smart, yeah. (laughs) So I don't know. I I still feel bad for these scientists. They were doing everything right, and then Bond blundered in and murdered them both. But you're right. You 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 have raised a plausible explanation that that they probably did know that they were making fatal only to humans nerve gas. Hmm. So I will forgive Bond in this instance. While Bond tries to make his escape, he is ambushed by Chang in full kendo gear, complete with the kendo stick, face mask, and everything. And so the shinai. Thank you, the shinai. So I was desperately trying to remember what it was actually called and not just make a wrestling reference. It's a kendo stick. Yeah. They're also not super fatal. No, the whole point is that they they only kind of sting a bit. Yeah, I mean, like you could you could mess somebody up with a sheen eye. No doubt about it. You could mess somebody up with one, but they're specifically non-lethal swords. <laughs> yeah, the point is that they make a big noise, like they go clack and they make a big noise. And if you yeah, like for those who have watched wrestling, they use them a lot because they make a big noise. And when you slap someone across the back with them, they raise a big red welt and they look awful and they'll probably hurt a bit the next day. But you're not going to get permanently injured by one. Yeah. So it's not maybe as scary as Bond makes it look. <laughs> It does lead to a great fight scene, though. (laughs) Apparently, this scene used the most sugar glass of any movie at the time it was filmed. (laughs) (laughs) I have no doubt about it. Because Bond runs back into that glass museum. And Chang chases after him. And the rest of the sequence is just Bond running away from Chang or throwing Chang around the room as they destroy all of these priceless artifacts. Yeah. The highlight of the scene, of course, is the bowl that they were talked to. Like, there's there's two major, like, highlights in this scene. One being Bond picks up Louis XIII's sword and, like actually fights Chang with a real sword while Chang is coming at him with the Shinai. Then also there's the the scene where Bond picks up the bowl, the like $1.5 million bowl, to hurl it at Chang. But of course, as soon as he picks it up, the alarm goes off, which causes him to have second thoughts. So he looks at it and then he puts it back down on the pedestal just in time for Chang, who has now picked up a piece of like plate armor to run at Bond, wing it through the air and smash the top off the bowl, which has now been placed back on the pedestal. I I choose to believe that Bond put the bowl back because the sound was annoying. Like that's <laughs> that's my interpretation of his facial expression in that moment is that he was like he, picks yeah, he the just bowl doesn't up. want the he, to go for the remainder of the fight. Yeah, that's my moment. That's my Bond moment of the movie, by the way. All right. <laughs> totally fair. Yeah. 
So they continue to fight. They continue to break things. Eventually, Chang knocks Bond over and runs away up into a clock tower where Bond notices some crates with Drax's logo on them labeled to ship to Rio de Janeiro that apparently are full of the things that he saw the scientists packing up earlier. He and Chang continue to fight all the way up this clock tower. It's a pretty sweet set. Like it's this really cool looking clock tower that it's all dark inside, but there's light on the clock face coming in from the square outside. Mm -hmm. They continue to fight. And eventually as the band outside reaches a high note, Bond hurls Chang out the window who falls to his death through the piano in the middle of the square surrounded by a bunch of diners. I can't remember exactly Bond's quip at the end of this scene. Uh, he, he says, play it again, Sam. Right, which is not the quote. <laughs> That's a that's a Luke I am your father quote. You know that, right? Yeah. I don't I don't remember what the original is, but I know it's one of like one of those among the many quotable lines from Casablanca, which is worth a watch. The lines in the original movie are play it once, Sam, for old time's sake. Sam says, I don't know what you mean, Miss Ilsa. Play it, Sam. Play as time goes by. So much like Beam Me Up Scotty and Luke I Am Your Father, nobody in the movie actually says, play it again, Sam. Mm -hmm. There are so many quotable lines from Casablanca that just keep showing up. Like, uh, round up the usual suspects. I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Yeah. You know, these like, it's... It's almost like Casablanca was incredibly influential. Right? <laughs> I think my favorite is, what's your nationality? I'm a drunkard. Oh, that makes Rick a citizen of the world. <laughs> Anyway, sorry. Um. <laughs> Welcome to From Casablanca with Love. It's got one episode. I'm sure there's a Casablanca too. <laughs> Don't put that voodoo on me. Are you Googling it? I definitely am. In 2008, the Daily Mail reported that Madonna was pursuing a remake set in modern day Iraq. Well, that never happened and we can all be thankful for that but they've tried yeah, you don't need to remake casablanca it's still there speaking of still there uh, is is moonraker which i guess we could keep talking about <laughs> Bond shows up in Dr. Goodhead's hotel room where she is, I guess, dressed for drinks since they said they were going to get drinks. And he appears in her room, having snuck in somehow. And he sort of like wanders around her room and he picks up the pen that's sitting on the desk in the room. And he's like, oh, interesting. And he clicks a button and a needle comes out of it. And he's like, huh, OK, that's interesting. And this whole scene now is just him picking up items of hers that do spy stuff and her staunchly not stopping him. She's channeling like big sheepish energy in this scene. This scene actually sort of marks the turning point of their relationship in the film because he's very much like, oh, this is a cyanide pen. Wouldn't want to get stuck with that. Oh, this handbag turns into a radio. Hmm, your perfume is actually a flamethrower. Huh, funny that. And she's like, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Um, uh, eventually he just goes, so you're with the CIA and she's like, yeah, you're right. Let's make out. So I don't have to tell you anymore. And he, while they're kissing, he pulls open the drawer beside the bed and there's a plane ticket to Rio there. And he's like, where are you going to go next? And she's like, I don't know. I don't have any plans to go anywhere. And the camera shows us that all of her bags are packed. By the way, nobody in the history of the world has ever put something important in the side drawer in a hotel room. No, I absolutely not. That's the best place to forget whatever it is that you have put there. Yeah, she does, in fact, work for the CIA. So presumably her being a NASA scientist was a cover and she's been put in at Drax's California facility to also try to get information out of him. Now we have a situation I said I was going to say it similar to The Spy Who Loved Me, where Bond and his co-star are working together, but against one another, kind of for different national intelligence agencies. Yeah, this this one is a little less against each other and a little more just like they're getting. Well, I guess. No, you're right. It is more similar than I'm giving it credit for because the beats are a little different, but they like they get in each other's way for a while and then they decide to cooperate. And when they cooperate, things go better for them mm -hmm. you're right so in the morning bond wakes up and sneaks he thinks he's sneaking out of the room the door isn't even closed before she gets up gets the phone and is like all right get the night porter to come get my bags so she's she's 
gone. Yeah. We cut to the morning back in St. Mark's Square and Bond M and Frederick Gray are there. They've apparently just overnighted and they're outside the Vanini glass place because Bond has cracked this whole thing wide open and he's here to show his superiors. So they approach the door with the key code. He gives them gas masks to put on. As they're walking towards the thing gray says you better be right about this i play bridge with drax (laughs) which i think is one of the few references to the book and he puts in the close encounters theme and they go inside and the lab is completely gone it is utterly dismantled and not there anymore and instead is this the opulent room that the lab was put into now occupied by drax who's just there and absolutely opulent furnishings again similar to like you only live twice the kind of stuff that would make bond be like how on earth did they manage to swap all of this out and in fact that's basically what the look on his face says drax is like ah well fancy meeting you here you're a little overdressed for the situation with your gas masks not being english i sometimes find your sense of humor difficult to follow (laughs) Yeah, they leave. They're essentially dismissed and they leave. And as they leave, the Minister of Defense is like, I have never been so embarrassed in my life. And he he just sort of says to M, M, you may want to take your man off this case. And Bond is at that point turns to M and is like, listen, the lab was there here. I have a vial of this poison from the lab on my person. And M is like, oh, so the lab did exist. And he's like, all right, well, you'd best take a couple of weeks leave. Where do you think you might go? And Bond says, well, I've always wanted to go to D- uh, Rio de Janeiro. I love this even more because he says, you'd better take some some leave of absence. Any thoughts where you might go? It's a very leading question. And Bond is like, oh, I've always had a hankering to go to Rio. And M says, I think I recall you mentioning that. Yeah. And then he says, no slip ups or we're both in trouble. That ends that scene. And then we have a quick cut back to Drax oh, right. who's like on the phone to the henchman delivery service I guess <laughs> <laughs> like henchman for hire because he's like yes we need a replacement for my man Chang oh yes if you can get him and then we cut to an airport <laughs> we cut to Jaws towering over everybody in the airport going through a metal detector and setting it off and the security guy tries to stop him and he just smiles and the security guy who looks like Don Knox is just like <laughs> and lets jaws go through <laughs> uh, it's so good it's such a great scene i love it we cut to a shot of the concord landing in rio we do indeed i did i did in fact not know that the concord serviced rio i didn't know either but apparently you could do london to rio in six hours i missed the concord i was never aware of it contemporaneously but i i (laughs) wish that super speed air travel still existed yeah it's just so cool not that i'm traveling anywhere these days but apparently roger moore had been delayed getting to rio because of kidney stones which sucks and the shot of him disembarking the concord he landed via concord got off went to like a little pop-up production room in the airport where they did hair and makeup and costuming went back up the stairs and then filmed james bond around Arriving in Rio via Concord. I half expected you to tell me that they had set up the driver outside the disembarkation ramp on the Concord and they just filmed him getting off the Concord and he walked over and shook hands with the driver and kept going. I wouldn't put it past them, but they did actually like have him come off and do hair and makeup and then then go back on. But that would have been pretty amazing. That's still quite impressive. This may be the least problematic disembarkation of an airplane for Bond. Well, it's not at 30,000 feet for one. (laughs) I just mean getting picked up at an airport usually goes badly for him. (laughs) But he gets picked up at the airport. Nothing weird with his driver. They are at one point followed by someone else who takes his picture. But then we very quickly determine that she is not actually a problem. He gets shown to the presidential suite of his hotel. And the woman that we saw in the other car taking a picture of him is also in the suite in his hotel. It's like the MI6 station person. This is Manuela, played by Emily Bolton. She's 007's contact. She has a lead for them to follow up on later tonight. And Bond is sort of like, well, what can we do until then? As he starts undressing her. And then we cut to Mardi Gras. The Mardi Gras scene is great. What astonishes me about this Mardi Gras scene is principal photography was 1979. There are shots in here here that are part of that principal photography shoot with like god hundreds of extras there are also shots in here of actual mardi gras during 1978 
Oh, wow. They sent a second unit and were just like, get B-roll of Mardi Gras because they were going to be done shooting before 1979's Mardi Gras happened. Huh. Yeah. That is cool. It blends really well. It's really seamless. Yeah. Yeah. So they make their way through the crowd at Mardi Gras into a back alley and Manuela is just like, all right, this is the place. Actually, before they get all the way down there, one of my favorite shots of the movie. All right, good. I I was going to come back to it, but yes, it's so good. Because they're going through the crowd and you see all these big figures, these exaggerated figurines, sort of like puppets almost. And they pass by one that kind of sticks out because it's a terrifying clown face and there's squirrels and other things. And then as they push through the crowd and walk away, the clown stops dancing and just starts watching them. And there's this long, steady shot where they push through the crowd and leave and the shot holds and your eyes are just drawn to the only motionless thing in the frame, which is the clown. And it's really unsettling. Oh, it's so creepy. Because everyone's just dancing and there's balloons and partying and everything's moving around. And the clown is just in the middle of this. Totally stationary. Not the focus of the shot in the way it's framed, but your eye is just immediately drawn to it. And you're like, I don't like that clown. What the hell? (laughs) Yeah. So Bond climbs the wall to get onto the roof to get into this building because it's locked from the outdoors. Mm -hmm. And as he departs, he says, don't talk to any strange men. And we have this shot of Manuela standing in the the alleyway, sort of looking a little uncomfortably around. Then we cut to this shot of the clown (gasps) gradually sauntering, like perfectly centered in frame, but just gradually sauntering down the alleyway towards them. And that is like that shot especially is so super unsettling it's just so creepy manuela feels relatively safe because there are like dancers and partiers that keep filtering into the alley so she just sort of makes her way over to them and tucks herself out of the way the clown takes the big clown head off the like enormous comically large clown head i don't know if we've made that clear that it's actually like a oh it's like a big paper mache yeah it's huge and the clown takes that off And underneath it is Jaws, who comes towards her and starts attacking her and is about to do his, you know, neck bitey thing when a bunch of partiers come out. And so he just sort of like picks her up and starts dancing around and pretends that they're dancing together. And she doesn't do or say anything. She's just like frozen. She doesn't scream for help or anything, which is kind of unbelievable. It seems like there's an opportunity to like get this crowd of partiers to, I don't know, start kicking Jaws a lot. Mm -hmm. Luckily, Bond comes back inside he discovered a bunch of stickers for Drax Air Freight. Now, that's about the extent of it. And so he comes back outside and sees Jaws and jumps down from the roof onto him. And they're about to fight and more partiers come by and him and Jaws are on either side of the alleyway. And then Jaws gets sort of like swept away by a group of partiers, which is also kind of unbelievable, but at least it's funny. It's a great little bit. He's not even that far away when Bond and Manuela are like, oh, well, anyway, what were we doing? (laughs) Yeah, I want to call attention to one particular shot in the fight. Bond jumps down realizes that it's jaws jaws like flashes his teeth at bond and bond just gives this huge toothy grin back in response to jaws i don't know what it is about this particular like it's like six frames of the film but it always gets me i love the smile the smile is so good almost certainly gonna be my bond moment of the movie the next day bond with still everyone just sort of like dancing and randomly doing mardi gras stuff i don't know if it's they're doing it again if they have if anyone slept i don't know how mardi gras works he heads to the cable car up to sugarloaf mountain and heads up to the top absolutely staggering views just Mm -hmm. an amazing location he's looking through a telescope because manuela told him that drax owns an airfield around there so he uses the tourism telescope there would have been so many easier ways to do this but this looks cool so all right so he takes a look at the airfield and there's planes taking off and then he moves the telescope all the way over to point at one of the other telescopes up there and it's Dr. Goodhead. Who's doing exactly the same thing. Who's doing exactly the same thing. And she's like, by the way, those planes are taking off every half hour. It also, by the way, it makes absolutely no sense that he's following one of the planes to get a shot of that it says Drax Air Freight on the side of the plane. He's following the plane and then the telescope ends up pointing at her and her telescope ends up pointing at him. What was she looking at? (laughs) 
She just did it for dramatic effect. She saw him walk off the gondola. I'm just filling in the blanks here, but she totally saw him walk off the gondola and is just playing it cool. I think so too, yeah. He approaches her and goes, haven't we met before somewhere? And she says, well, the face is familiar. And he puts his hand on her hand that is resting on the telescope. And she jerks her hand away from him and goes, as is the manner. <laughs> like she still does not like him, even though they did a sex. The upshot of this conversation is they're like, okay, fine, we'll work together. Okay, whatever, we'll we'll share information. Sure, why not? And they get back on one of the cable cars to go back down from the mountain. But Jaws is now in the cable car room, stops one of the gears by hand somehow, because he's impossibly strong. The cable car stops. Bond, I don't know why, but he's like, I think we would be safer outside the cable car. Also, grab that chain that's just there for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> so they climb out and go on top of the cable car. Jaws bites through one of the cables so that the cars don't move, except later they do. I don't know why Jaws bites through one of those cables. Yeah, you're right. It does move later. Mm. But he does bite the cable to stop it from go. Just go with it. The best part of this whole scene is Jaws like stops the wheel and then he goes to walk away from it to like go do his nefarious plan. And then the wheel like creaks and moves a bit and he like looks back at it and is like nah. and they do that they do the little like the wheel keeps looking like it's gonna move for for a couple of seconds it's a cute little bit i like it there's a bit where bond almost falls off the outside of the cable car which was done by a stuntman with, without a harness because the director asked if he was ready and they didn't have the harness in and didn't want to like hold everything up and so just held on no and uh, yeah and you you hear them talking about it like it's nothing and it's like don't do that that's not a good work environment i mean to be clear <laughs> nobody asked him no one pressured him to do it nobody was like you got to get out there and like do this give it a shot right now by by everyone's recollection of it there it was just a miscommunication and it was like oh it was like are you ready and the stuntman heard we are ready and he was like oh shoot um i guess i'm just gonna do this now then <laughs> rather than be like hold up i need to get my harness attached <laughs> right it's like this is absolutely wild anyway a associate of jaws who is not named and who we never see again gets into the control room of the cable car and knocks the guy out as jaws like hand over hands his way along the cable onto the roof of the other cable car what god this whole plan is so convoluted once in oh, place yeah. the associate turns the cable car on so that then they meet in the middle so you've got jaws on one cable car and bond and goodhead on the other cable car in the middle of the cables run up to the mountain i don't know what their plan was this Talking through, explaining what happens in the scene, like saying this out loud, it just makes it more and more stupid. I don't get the sense that Jaws is the smartest assassin. <laughs> He's just incredibly hard to kill and extremely menacing. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it works. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff in this scene that's very stupid, but like, I kind of love it anyhow. So like the two cable cars meet in the middle and Jaws just like hoops himself over onto Bond's cable car. They get in a big fight. Bond, of course, punches or headbutts. You'd think he'd learn, but he never does. He headbutts Jaws in the face and clangs off his metal jaw. Mm -hmm. The fight carries on. They ultimately managed between Bond and Holly managed to overpower him enough to knock him down into the cable car and they lock the roof. They manage to slam it down and lock it in place, trapping Jaws, at least momentarily, inside the cable car, at which point Bond is like, hand me that chain and swings it up over the cable and then is like, all right, hang on to me, kicks off the cable car and uses it like a zip line. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> I guarantee you, if you try that in real life, it will end very badly for you. So <laughs> probably fatal. But anyhow, it doesn't end badly for Bond. Well, it tries, but it doesn't end badly for Bond. Bond slides down, but the associate who is down in the control room sees that this is happening. So he starts the cable car moving, chasing after them. So they're sliding down the cable. The cable car is coming after them and at a faster pace than they are sliding inexplicably. So meanwhile, Jaws is like in the car, 
bearing down on them. The cable car is getting faster and faster and closer and closer. And at the last second, Bond is close enough to the ground and he he's like, all right, jump and let's go. And he and Holly drop to this nice little grassy field below the cable car as Jaws realizes that the car is now moving too fast to stop. And so the cable car smashes into the gondola building and out the other side with rubble and uh, no big explosions, but lots of like concrete and debris debris flying all over the place in what is evidently an extremely fatal crash except it's jaws yeah it looks super cool oh yeah it's a great blowing through the side of the building is awesome as the onlookers like run for cover desperate to to get out of harm's way jaws of course survives Mm -hmm. he has the like the big wheel cable wheel over his head so he sort of hefts it off himself as he's doing this a sweet pigtailed blonde haired maiden runs in from off screen looking for survivors i guess look yeah looking for survivors as the classic romantic meet cute music begins to swell i don't know the name of it i'm sure oh it's we it's, can look it's it up. the like it's the isn't it spring oh spring yes is it Vivaldi's season? Yeah, isn't it? It's it, it's it's the music when you have like two people in a field of flowers running towards each other. Yes. Ending in a hug. Is it da 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 da? You know, it, you, you everyone knows it. Yes. Jaws dusts himself off and smiles and she smiles back at him and then they take each other's hand and walk off shot as Bond <laughs> looks on from below. A little puzzled look on his face, but uh, Bond and, and Holly have survived the ordeal. So I'm sorry, it is Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet Overture. Oh, OK. Well, we're, we're going to get hate mail for having named it Vivaldi's season spring. But at least we corrected ourselves in the episode. As long as someone didn't make the YouTube comment in the past 25 seconds. Nobody would stop listening to a podcast to issue a correction in the comments oh, I have s- before going back and continuing to listen to the rest of the podcast. I have such bad news for you. <laughs> <laughs> Surely no one would do that. So anyhow, Holly gives Bond a smooch for saving her life as they are making out in this field. Some paramedics run up behind them and Bond is like, oh, no, 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 we're OK. We, we don't need any help and proceeds to get like billy clubbed over the back of the head. He and Holly are carted off into the back of an ambulance where they are restrained. They get tied to their gurneys and Bond comes to in the back of this ambulance as they are being carted off to they know not where. I briefly want to talk a little bit about Jaws meeting Dolly because there's a weird... Are you familiar with the Mandela effect, the concept of the Mandela effect? Yes. Yeah. For those who aren't listeners at home, it basically boils down to human beings have bad memories and we fill in weird gaps and are convinced that we remember there are certain things that didn't happen. The name comes from people who are positive that they remember Nelson Mandela dying in prison, whereas he actually was released from prison and lived for many years. Also known as the Berenstain Rift, whereas the whether it's yes. the, the Berenstain or Berenstain Berenstain bears. I definitely come from the Berenstain universe. <laughs> if you come at it from a position where it's a fun thing to joke about, the you, you know, rather than actual fact, the 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 fun thing to think about with the Mandela effect is that it's you know it's from two different universes, right? And in one universe, all these things are true. In another universe, all these things are true. There's other examples like the film. God, is it? I can't remember which one's fake now. Is part of the problem, but it's uh, <laughs> Kazam the movie. Oh yeah, yeah. Kazam with Shaquille O'Neal. Right. Yes. Kazam was a real movie with Shaquille O'Neal, but people remember that it was Shazam. Not sure that Kazam was the movie with Shaquille O'Neal. No, it is. <laughs> ah, okay. It is. Good. Good. This good. is the problem. Sorry. This is the my, problem. My Google search for Kazam did not turn up any results, and I was like, oh, no. It's spelled because it's K-A-Z-A-A-M, so it's hard yeah. to... Anyway. Yeah, yeah. So there are a number of people who are convinced that they remember seeing the scene of Dolly meeting Jaws, and Dolly had braces. Oh. They're like... Why did they change it? Why did they edit that out? It made perfect sense because that was that was what brought them together. It was that she had braces and Jaws was like, oh, we have a connection. There's even people being like, now, originally she did have braces in this scene, but then didn't later and that caused a continuity error. So for the Blu-rays, they edited that out. None of that's true. There's huh. even YouTube videos with like, look, original VHS rip where Dolly had braces and it's clearly a like digital composite where someone has added teeth with braces back in. <laughs> 
Dolly never had braces. They just make a connection because they're in love. It's not, it's not, a, there's not a teeth thing. But I just thought it was interesting that I was like, I had read someone be like, they edited out her braces. I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? And then went looking for it. And it's this whole, oh, this is this, this horrible pit of people getting very <laughs> angry at one another. And I'm sure that some people in the comments for this video will even be like, I absolutely remember her having braces. The, the reason that the Mandela effect is so insidious is because human beings have bad memory and we're really susceptible to suggestion. And so yeah. even by bringing it up here, I have it put into your heads some number of listeners at home that you definitely remember this thing happening. You're you're sitting here implanting false memories, Graham. <sighs> it's a hobby. <laughs> What can I say? <laughs> All right. So we're aboard the ambulance. What happens? Bond manages to get his hands free while Holly is distracting the man in the back of the ambulance. The ambulance, by the way, which is just hauling ass up a bunch of switchbacks up a hill, passing by a variety of billboards because this movie had so many corporate sponsors. Pop quiz. Uh huh. What was the primary sponsor? The, the one that you see the most of in the film? Oh, oh, uh, seven up. Yeah, absolutely. It's everywhere. Yeah, there's a lot of 7-Up. There's billboards for British Airways, for Marlboro, I remember. There's a lot. And so Bond gets free, hits the fire extinguisher, which is enough to sort of distract the guy. Anyway, he and this guy end up in a fist fight. Goodhead can't get free. These two start fighting. They get onto the other gurney and they go flying out the back of the truck. Goodhead is still in the ambulance and gets driven away. Bond jumps off the gurney and the doctor on the gurney goes flying into a billboard for, I think it's British airways he ends up in the mouth of the woman pictured on the billboard it's like a very funny comedy shot is the idea anyway so she's gone and bond doesn't know where she's going bond starts walking up the road and then we cut to bond and two other men riding horses so bond starts walking up the road as a familiar musical theme begins to play in fact we, we're doing yet another music joke yeah because this is the theme from the magnificent seven yeah uh, were you looking for tonal consistency in this movie because i'm afraid you're going to want to look elsewhere because so far we have been to france in california we have been to england in france in california we have been to venice we've been to rio de janeiro and now we're in the wild west and we have still got to get to space <laughs> I forgot about that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> There's still 53 minutes of the movie to go. Oh, my God. Thankfully, most of it is laser beams, so we'll be able to get through that pretty quick. So yeah, they, they're riding on horseback. They ride into a town. Yeah, they end up at a monastery. Oh, <laughs> You know what's funny? Because <laughs> you were just talking. Sorry, I had to just look this up because I was looking up the locations. You know, because you know, you're funny. Mm -hmm. You were talking about the inconsistency. The, yeah. the location for this monastery is near Venice. Standing in for a monastery in Brazil. Yeah. Channeling the filmatic stylings of a spaghetti western. Yeah. Which, of course, would have been filmed in Italy with Bond in doing his best Clint Eastwood impression at the moment, complete with striped poncho and cowboy hat. That's yeah. very weird. This is a weird one. So this is another in the list of location offices. So Bond eventually finds his way to Money Penny's desk and she indicates where he can find Q and M. And he does. Goes and meets with Q, who's experimenting with an exploding bolus. And so we get to see a gaucho throw the bolus and it wraps around someone's head and explodes. Some sort of South American dictator looking mannequin. There's also a man having a siesta and then the man breaks open and it's like a turret gun. It's very, yep. very strange. And then also there's randomly a guy firing a like laser pistol. That's weird. I wonder it's if that'll... so out of place. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I, right? I kind of love it, but it's so out of place. There's just like a monk firing a laser gun at a mannequin and the mannequin's head is melting. Super weird. And it's like stark white with blue lasers firing out of the front. Iconically, it is the Moonraker laser from Goldeneye. But yeah. that, of course, was the Moonraker laser from Moonraker. <laughs> <laughs> and it goes like pew, 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 pew. Oh, the sound effect is great. Eventually, Bond and Q go to M's office. M is like, okay, so that stuff you found was indeed super lethal and it's a big problem. Here's the chemical breakdown of it. It comes from this orchid, this like amazing orchid that we thought was extinct until someone found it here. And Bond is like, yes, I know where that is. I'm going to go find it. Can you get me a boat? And so then we get Bond on a boat in the jungle. Did you want a second boat chase? <laughs> Good news. Yeah. Not only is this the second 
second boat chase of the movie, it's also utterly meaningless. Yeah, it sure is. Completely gratuitous. Bond is driving his boat, and then suddenly there's another boat there, and Jaws is driving it, chases after him, and the TLDR is Bond tries to outrun them and ends up heading towards the Iguazu Falls, which is this amazing waterfall. Cubby Broccoli wanted to film there because he'd been there on a vacation or something. It's a great location. It is. It's gorgeous. Bond presses a button and a hang glider pops out of his boat and he pops out of the boat on the hang glider and Jaws and his cronies go flying off the falls. Is this, I've just summarized like seven minutes for you. Like nothing <laughs> happens. Yeah, in this scene is completely unnecessary. Yeah, it, it, it's a fun little like connecting scene, but it goes on way too long. The boat is sweet, though. It's got mines. It's got a hang glider. It's super sexy looking. Oh, yeah, he yeah. blows up a boat with the mines. That's fun. But yeah, the music. Sorry, the music in this scene is rad, though. Oh, what's the name? This is the piece of music that I always get. I always mistake for the battle theme in Evangelion. Oh, wow. For whatever reason, this piece of music, it's it's I think it's literally called James Bond. This song just sounds a ton like the battle music from Evangelion, but it's got a really nice like sort of I, I I almost want to call it like the kind of music you would hear as cowboys are riding across the prairie. Now I'm looking it up. I want to make sure I name it correctly. All right. This is 007 from the John Barry Orchestra, which was written for, for From Russia With Love. <laughs> <laughs> which is a whole lot of run around to, to figure out the song that is in fact just being reused from previous film. I still love this song. It rules. Bond's hang glider crashes in the jungle and he just starts wandering around the jungle until he spots a woman dressed all in white wandering away from him in the distance. And he follows her for some time. Like he follows her for a long while eventually to a ziggurat and follows her inside the like secret door inside the ziggurat i think this is actually the same woman who was working at the glass blowing place it totally is who by the way is named urka bochenko who later became a musician using the pseudonym iron bow and recorded a single called happy birthday mr bond for the 50th anniversary of the james bond film franchise oh. yeah, with background vocals from sir roger moore <laughs> so he follows her inside and on the inside it is revealed to be a phenomenal set of drax's amazing south american place it's like a part temple part waterfall and rock and metal bridge it's this like i think he called it the sanctum it's a really cool i think ken adam called it a sanctum yeah. it's a really really cool set a bunch of the other women that we've seen through the movie like the people that drax introduced in his place in california the one running the the tour at the glass blowing place they all appear wearing these uniforms that you talked about earlier you mentioned the egyptian set this is the inspiration for the level aztec in golden eye 64 oh yeah Absolutely. This room and one of the later rooms, well, a few of the later rooms that we will encounter through the remainder of the like climactic sequence of this film are almost identically as faithfully recreated on an N64 as you can imagine a room <laughs> being recreated on an N64. <laughs> Which is, you know, it's, it's, it's not bad. Bond carefully avoids walking directly across the bridge because, you know, he knows how th this sort of thing goes. So he walks <laughs> around the pool in the middle of the room, but one of the rocks upturns and dumps him into the pool, which he thinks is terribly amusing. And then a giant snake comes into the pool, a huge python, and starts chasing him. And he has to wrestle with this enormous python, which they shot in Miami, or they shot in Florida, at least, oh, yeah. with the stuntman. And the python was not interested in fighting people because you're not food. The python doesn't give a crap. And so right. the way that they got it to chase the stunt performer was just put the food on the far side of the stunt performer so that the python had to go past him and then had the performer <laughs> go like, oh, no, and pretend like the snake was attacking him. Well, credit to this movie, the python being a constrictor at least does try to constrict Bond. Mm. Oh, yeah. Wait, they don't treat it like a venomous snake. Quick, we're snakes on film. We got a giant snake in Moonraker. Here we go. Snakes on film. Mr. Bond falls into a pool containing his, uh, the pattern most closely resembles a reticulated python. In this case, a morbidly obese one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a poor thing. Reticulated pythons come from Southeast Asia. Drax's lairs in the Amazon. Thanks, snakes on film. Anyway, uh... <laughs> 
<laughs> You're ruining the magic. Bond produces Goodhead's cyanide pen, which I guess he stole, and stabs the not particularly convincing fake python in the bottom of the face and drags himself out of the pool where he is met by Jaws, a very damp, angry Jaws who has made amazing time from the bottom of that waterfall. <laughs> No doubt, eh? Pulls Bond bodily out of the pool, and then Drax arrives, <laughs> accompanied with two guards wearing <laughs> the dumbest looking helmets. The helmets are what really drives home the connection to GoldenEye 007, because those exact guards yeah. with those exact guns and those exact dumb, stupid hats populated this entire level. <laughs> Anyway, so Drax comes in and says, Mr. Bond, you defy all my attempts to plan an amusing death for you. <laughs> it's true. The attempts have been all amusing. So why did you break off the encounter with my pet python? Bond retorts, I discovered he had a crush on me. Ha <laughs> ha! So in we go now to Drax's control room. This is another pretty amazing set. It's just full of monitors and full of, again, my staffing question comes up, but I'm not going to go deep on it. <laughs> We've already had henchmen or us turn up once in this film. Yeah, I guess there's just somewhere you can call. He asks Drax what's going on. Drax has one of those amazing orchids that Q was talking about here, and he's discovered the orchids and the things that they do and weaponized gas that can be made out of them. Does he fully reveal his plan here, or is it once they get to the space station? I think it's not until they get to the space station. What we do learn here is, like, the orchids are involved, and they are launching the Moonraker shuttles, and they are launching multiples of them. Mm -hmm. Drax is actually interrupted by the launch of Moonraker 1 as it lifts off. They launch Moonraker 1, launch Moonraker 2, but he does reveal what the fate was of the Moonraker that got stolen. Yeah, because Bond is like, you make these. Why did you steal one? Yeah, and he says, well, because I needed it. One of my Moonrakers that I built developed a fault during pre-launch testing. And so my only alternative to be able to enact my greater plan was to steal back my own shuttle so that I had everything I needed to enact this plan. <laughs> and it's like, is that, that's, that's it? Huh. Okay. So Jaws takes, I did get major GoldenEye 64 flashbacks watching some of these scenes. Yeah. Jaws takes Bond down a corridor and into a set that was for a deleted scene that didn't end up get, getting used. But it's such an amazing set. It's this conference room that's also the exhaust port for the shuttles. <laughs> <laughs> so Bond gets thrown in and Holly Goodhead is in there and she's really happy to see him and they embrace. Then they get ready to launch one of the shuttles from this location and the entire conference table and all the chairs around it lower and flatten into the ground. It's amazing. So let me tell you, if I was on Drax's staff... There is no conceivable way you could get me to attend a meeting in this meeting room that Drax is not currently present for. <laughs> no kidding, right? I would be late to every single meeting on purpose and be inexplicably called away five minutes before any meeting ends. Yeah, is Drax at this meeting? No? Oh, that's, ooh, I've got lunch, I think. <laughs> Jeez, I got a conflict. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, awkward. <laughs> the ceiling opens up and the space shuttle is just there directly above them. And Drax appears and is like, all right, well, you two have fun down there and I'll be up in space doing my plan. Bond is like, OK, there's an exhaust vent here. We have to try and get away. And his watch has like a loop of plastic explosive inside of it. Mm -hmm. And so he in a detonator bit built into the crown. Yeah, why not? So they hide around the corner, blow open this grate and he takes time there's like five seconds and he takes time to make a quip about like oh you know right on time or something like that before dashing out of the room it's such a good joke though bang on time after using his watch to blow something up <laughs> but then they have them like there's no way you could outrun the exhaust <laughs> from a space shuttle <laughs> they'd be immolated at any distance oh yeah <laughs> They get away and we see a bunch of folks, the people dressed in white and the people dressed in yellow. Like there's the people, there's like the staff dressed in yellow and the stupid helmets that are sort of getting things together. And then who appear to be the passengers, which are all the amazingly attractive people dressed in white. They're all preparing because there's another Moonraker shuttle at this same base and they're preparing to take off. 
Bond and Goodhead sneak into one of these little carts that's moving cargo around. They go through this amazing, this is actually a location. This is a mine, this amazing location. Oh, wow. Of these caves. Yeah. They realize they're not going the right way, so they jump off the thing, and then they hear an announcement that the pilots have to make their way to the shuttles, and the little, like, <laughs> Jetsons car going... <laughs> <laughs> comes up to them and they jump in front of it, attack the pilots, drag them to the side and disguise themselves as pilots. Just sort of get on, the, like no one questions it. They're just like, and they get on the shuttle and there was no problems. Mm -hmm. Went way better than you only live twice. So they climb onto the shuttle and they're like, okay, they exchange this glance of like, I guess we're going to space. And Dr. Goodhead makes some sort of comment about like, it's all automated trajectory, so we'll be fine. There's a really cool bit where there's a shot of the shuttle in high atmosphere leaving a contrail behind it. Mm -hmm. Derek Meddings describes the way that they did that is they had a hollow shuttle with a couple holes in the bottom and they filled it with salt. <laughs> And they just held it. Well, it looks great. It looks great, but they just held it there and it's actually just salt coming out the back of it. <laughs> so all the Moonraker shuttles sort of form up in the atmosphere and they start moving towards, well, nothing as far as they can see on the radar. And then visually, this is probably my favorite shot of the whole movie because it's astonishing. This shot of the sunlight revealing this enormous space station in orbit. Yeah. There's a couple random shots in there of like weightless stuff of her like grabbing a pen and being like oh we're weightless do you get it but then we see this space station being revealed and it's an astonishing shot they look in back of what's in their cargo and their cargo is those people that we saw all the people in white and they're all making out <laughs> <laughs> they're all they're yeah. the space shuttles are full of horny attractive people yeah <laughs> to drive the point home they are seated as couples mm -hmm. so it's like 12 or 16 couples of men and women seated in the back of their shuttle bond even mentions it's like ah they go forward two by two like noah's ark yeah yeah they dock and one of the pilots goes on board and there's a cool little weightlessness sequence on this enormous interior set and he activates gravity control, basically starts the whole space station spinning to force a simulated gravity, which we're just going to pretend is how that works. Now, I like that they at least acknowledge that the gravity would be different on different parts of the station. I did like that. Once the gravity is started up, they like make their way to a different part of the, the thing. It's like, oh, there's going to be no gravity past here is zero gravity area. But yeah, there's a little counter. It's like, oh, we're at 0.9 G's. Everything's cool. Among all the people is also jaws and his new girlfriend who may be of average height but looks absolutely diminutive next to richard keel <laughs> and everyone gets together in this huge room and drax explains his plan basically and i will forego doing the voice but his plan here's the third beat of that joke is very similar to the spy who loved me it is yeah slightly different in scale slightly different in scale but it's basically he thinks that humanity is sucks which is not incorrect but he his plan is he's brought all these people to space he's going to send these pods full of nerve gas out over the whole planet kill all humans but leave all plants and animals alive and then repopulate the planet from this master race of people that he has brought up to the space station. Yes, he's a little more explicitly a Nazi than Stromberg was. We, we th That's where we're at with this movie. They're space Nazis. To the credit of him and also the, the writers, the master race are racially diverse. Yes. They're all just... They're all just, quote, prime physical specimens. Yeah, they're all just really attractive. And I don't know, we hope they're smart, I guess. Maybe he doesn't care. But, you know, there is a bit of the sort of goofing on how Hitler himself did not even meet his requirements of master race Aryan perfection, right? Where it's like, right. he's got this pantheon of amazing people and you look at Drax and it's like, you don't fit the bill, man. <laughs> Bond and Goodhead realize that they need to do something about it and the easiest, quickest way to do something about it is to let Earth know that this place is here so they go to find the radar jamming controls because they realize that they couldn't see it on radar when they approached it so there must be some way to disable that. Right. At this point, no one has any reason to believe that anyone who's wandering around in one of those uniforms and is on the space station wouldn't be one of the people who's supposed to be there. So there's no problem. They just
just sort of wander into the radar zone and say hi and then just knock out the people at the radar. Actually, Dr. Goodhead does most of the fighting in this scene, which is kind of, mm-hmm. kind of cool. Apparently, Lois Childs was on the shortlist to play Agent Triple X, but then wanted no. to take a break from acting. I would have loved her in that role. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Goodhead feels much more like an equal to Bond in this movie than Barbara Bach's character did in The Spy Who Loved Me. Yeah, I in terms of of like the characterization, I think this movie does a much better service to Dr. Goodhead than it did to Agent Triple X. Yeah, she actually gets to do stuff. <laughs> yeah, she like and not only that, like Bond would have been screwed without her help. Oh yeah. Right? Like Bond knows how to do a lot of things, but he does not know how to fly a space shuttle. No, and you know, she's she talked about how it's autopilot, but she still did, did a lot of stuff on the space shuttle. And she's like, okay, it's a radar thing. I know how to do that. And she's the one who leads them there and disables the radar, the the radar jam. Yeah, I mean, she noted that it was on an automatic flight program because she's trained how to know that (laughs) (laughs) you bring up a really good point so they disable the radar jammer and immediately everyone on earth is like whoa what the hell what is going on up there (laughs) and we see an american general on the phone with general gogol being like look it's not one of ours i will extend you the courtesy of assuming it's not one of yours we're gonna go up there and we're gonna see what's up and try to deal with it and general gogol is like okay for now, I will believe that it's not one of yours. And assuming you deal with it, there won't be a problem. And if you don't, then you'll have a problem. You've got 12 hours. Yeah. And then he's like, OK, sounds good. Sorry to have disturbed you, General Gogol. I know it's late there. And he's like, oh, I wasn't I wasn't sleeping anyway. You know, like it's very, yeah. they're very casual conversational. Yeah. So at this point, Drax doesn't know that they're visible and is still just launching these probes of nerve gas all over the world. Jaws finds Bond and Goodhead and <laughs> drags them back to Drax. Not before Bond tries to punch Jaws in the mouth, which is a big problem. Again. And then knees him in the junk, which also goes clang i forgot about that much to to bond's concern and consternation uh the marines launch a space shuttle the marines have a space shuttle it has their logo on it i don't know when it was determined (laughs) that the marines have jurisdiction over space as far as the u.s military is concerned but this obviously precedes the space force and yeah (laughs) so it's kind of funny i just love that everyone has this space shuttle that again this is 1979 and nasa wouldn't even launch (laughs) theirs for another couple years and just everyone's just teaming with space shuttles yeah the marines got them first on the space station someone's like uh there's a shuttle launch in the u.s and they're definitely not scheduled for one of those and drax is like hmm go check on the radar thing and make sure that we're not exposed and then jaws shows up with bond and good head and he's like ah okay i see what's up here yeah so they they exchange some words at this point we're just on the burn down to the end there's not that much else that actually is super relevant it's just a matter of watching all the pieces fall into place right so they're still launching the probes now that bond and good head are face to face with drax drax is just like oh yeah i plan to kill everybody we'll reseed the earth with the prime specimens of humanity and there's nothing you can do to stop it my plan is already in motion he monologues forever like there's just a really like drax just sort of goes on for a while he introduces bond to an airlock he's like by the way this is where you will be killed if you want to step into the airlock so i can eject you into space that would be awesome and bond is like before you do that just to double check you're so you know you talk about your amazing specimens what about people that are you know that don't match up that are different or unusual in some way, he says, like, pointedly noting Jaws and Drax is like, oh, they'll be dealt with. You know, obviously we won't we won't have any of them. And so you see Jaws sort of start to get a conscience. Jaws is in his face. He's like, wait, wait a minute. What? Wait, what? And Dolly, his girlfriend, is also like, wait, hang on. What? I'm short. <laughs> <laughs> and they look upset about this. Apparently, director Lewis Gilbert got many, many letters from children who loved Jaws, basically asking why he had to be a bad guy. Aww. You know, like, why can't Jaws be a good guy? And they were like, wait, yeah. Why can't Jaws be a good guy? Why can't Jaws be a good guy? Just because you're a bad guy doesn't mean you're a bad guy. Right? <laughs> So Jaws has a change of heart, basically, because Drax orders him to yeet Bond into the airlock. And Jaws is like, I don't know about that. Turns around and indicates for two mooks to grab Bond and Goodhead. And when they step close enough, Jaws grabs them and knocks their heads together like a cartoon. And Bond and Goodhead (laughs) take this as an opportunity to raise some hell because now Jaws is on their side. Doesn't go very long, though. 
they get the like there are so many guards around that the three of them don't really stand much of a chance yeah they immediately get held at gunpoint <laughs> but it, it causes enough of a delay in the the air locking plan that now the the marines are within firing range of the station so drax delays their execution and orders the gunner to take aim at the marine space shuttle so that they can blow it out of the sky and he's like i guess you're just gonna have to watch as we destroy your last hope at saving the world and as this is happening and everybody's distracted by this bond sees the emergency station rotation shut off button and so he dives at the button hammers it the retro rockets fire the station comes to a halt everybody on the station gets like launched to the side of the room as the station comes to a stop then they all begin to float weightless except for drax who makes a real effort (laughs) <laughs> to make it look like he's weightless by sort of walking around the edge of the room. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm the least convincing. <laughs> the the weightless scene here at least at the time of its filming, held the world record for the most number of zero G wires in a single scene. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And there's a lot. The like the first weightless scene with them all, there are a lot of people floating weightless in this yeah. room. It's sweet. With the Marines shuttle approaching the space station, the station sends out a bunch of basically space walkers with full spacesuits and rocket packs and laser guns. And so the Marines and the space shuttle are like, all right, open the cargo bay, send out our own guys that we had planned for this. Do you remember the climactic battle in Thunderball? Yes. It's like that, but in space. Yes. And with a lot more blop, blop, blops. Yeah. Like the lasers are cool and everything. And apparently it was just a absolute bastard to film in terms of the <laughs> miniatures and doing like they they were doing like multiple exposures and things like that but it is the same problem as the scene in thunderball where it's just like random shots of people shooting and other people dying yeah it's just a lot of pew, pew. My, so on that same problem they do manage to get aboard the station right mm-hmm. And some of the the astronauts do finally manage to board the station. The station is still weightless. And of course, the only way that they can show that the station is weightless on their budget is to have everybody move in slow motion like they were practicing in Diamonds Are Forever. (laughs) And so for the portion of the scene where the the station is still weightless, everybody is moving in slow motion on the station. It's hilarious, but it is not super exciting. (laughs) It really isn't. (laughs) But they do manage to get the station spinning again. One of the technicians manages to hit it. And then we have a full blown like classic gunfight of the like you only live twice. The ninjas are raiding the base kind of a situation as the Marines with their laser guns board the station. The station staff all grab their laser guns and people are running around shooting laser beams at one another and a whole bunch of chaos ensues. And that's fun. We get some we get some cool fights there. They increase security. I don't know how they do that with I don't know where they just find more people, but they increase security. But Bond, Goodhead, and Jaws help the Marines get into the main control room, and everything goes to absolute hell, and the whole thing starts falling apart. Drax runs away, finds a laser gun. Bond puts his hands up to delay, and Spider-Man web shooters Drax with one of the tranquilizer darts. Drax does a like extended stage death as he backs into the airlock at the end of the hall, and Bond hits the button and Drax gets ejected into the cold embrace of space and starts <laughs> tumbling away. And they sort of make this like idle reference to how once the station breaks up, all the pods of nerve gas that are still on board will be destroyed. I don't know how you would know that, but sure. But the problem is the ones that have gotten away. So they yell at the Marines. They're mm-hmm. like, look, the station's falling apart. Get your men out of here. We've done all the good we can. He and Goodhead get on board one of the Moonraker shuttles to try and go out and manually shoot down the pods. They get on board. The surviving Marines get away. Bond and Goodhead can't detach from the docking clamps, essentially, because of mechanical failures. By the way, a lot of the shots of the station getting blown apart because they wanted it to blow up, but they're like, we can't do big fireball explosions in space. That doesn't make sense. We just need the thing to blow up. So what they did is they closed the set and they got the miniature. The miniature, by the way, is like 30 foot across. Like the miniature is enormous. Right. They got the miniature and they got a shotgun and they just started taking pot shots at the, at the model. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Inside, Jaws, who looks very concerned, does eventually find 
Dolly. They're very happy to see one another at the same time as being basically resigned to die on this space station. So they find some of Drax's Bollinger. Jaws pops the cork with his mouth and then he pours glasses for each of them and then speaks his only line of dialogue in both movies, which is, well, here's to us. (laughs) I just, I love (laughs) that he has such a normal pleasant voice yeah <laughs> that he's just he's just he hasn't talked until now but just because he hasn't really wanted to yeah he's just a quiet dude they go over to the window to wave at bond and he's like hey we can't get out of here can you help us and jaws is like yeah yeah, yeah i got you and goes over and like manually releases the space shuttle their section of the station like shears off of the rest of it and bond watches it go flying off and he's like oh they'll be okay then they are they're, they're actually gonna land safely i don't know what basis he's placed that on uh, he's jaws we do eventually yeah maybe he has an aura uh we do eventually hear that like a section of the space station crashed down and there's an enormous man and a small woman inside and they're fine jaws and dolly <laughs> do indeed survive bond and goodhead watch as the station finally explodes and tears itself apart and then they chase down the remaining probes they get two of them the third one is a little trickier because they're about to re-enter i don't know how they expected the probe to survive re-entry but you know it's like tense for a moment well they're designed for it sure that's true goodhead is keeping the shuttle steady bond manually aims the laser and eventually blows up the last thing because each of these pods has a payload of like a hundred million people or something like that there were 50 pods all together to wipe out all life on earth and the last one is destroyed successfully and everyone down at mission control looks happy and thrilled and then we see that Bond has created some sort of weird hammock or it's actually it was already there. I guess this is maybe Drax's private Moonraker. There's some sort of bed in the back. <laughs> it is Drax. It's Moonraker 5, which was Drax's specifically because it had the laser. So they start immediately making out. They're like, well, we saved the world. Let's just immediately start boning down, even though our space shuttle is re-entering the atmosphere. So this guy at Mission Control is like, I'm patching into the onboard cameras now. Don't ask me how I can do that. It's such a momentous occasion. I'm sending the video directly to the president and the queen and possibly the (laughs) least believable part of this entire movie is that at no point in this scene does m who knows who james bond is begin to raise an objection (laughs) surely m of all people should have been like i don't think that's a good idea because he's probably having sex (laughs) and the video feed comes in (laughs) and indeed that's what's happening frederick gray says good lord what's he doing and q says it looks like he's attempting re-entry sir (laughs) bond unplugs the camera at the end (laughs) <laughs> yeah <laughs> there we go there we go that was moonraker what a profoundly silly movie so what do you think <laughs> it was oh god this is i think this is as silly as they get you think I, <laughs> no. I don't know about that <laughs> really oh no i can think of some silly silly movies still to come oh, no are you referring only to the roger moore era yes just because i don't know what you could be talking about for the Roger Moore era, yes, this is as silly as they get, I think. I think. Like, it must. I love me of you to a kill, but Octopussy, the whole, like, climax of Octopussy takes place literally in a circus. I don't remember that movie. Oh, count yourself lucky. I think I've seen part of it once. <laughs> <laughs> So that's yet to come. Oh, goody. But like View to a Kill is real silly. View to a Kill is great. I'm, I mean, I'm spoiling my opinions of future movies as I remember them because we haven't watched them yet. But View to a Kill is great, but it's very silly. Mm-hmm. And then the Roger Moore movie that I can never remember is For Your Eyes Only. Well, that's next. And I remember nothing. Well, that's not quite true. I remember one thing from that movie, but that movie may as well not exist in my memory. So I assume that one's not going to be as silly. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Uh, so how are we going to rank things? Let's let's take a look at the pre-title. I'll I cuz I, I I think I have a fairly good sort of baseline for it. Very similarly to The Spy Who Loved Me, it's like a bit of plot setup and then a big stunt. I put The Spy Who Loved Me fourth and I actually think that the skydiving fist fight is way cooler than the skiing base jump. This is now my number four pre-title behind From Russia With Love, You Only Live Twice, Live and Let Die, and then this movie. Yeah, I think this one goes behind The Spy Who Loved Me for me, but ahead of You Only Live Twice. 
the reason being that Spy Who Loved Me is a way better hook into the movie and doesn't undermine itself as badly as this one does. Mm -hmm. That's true. With the like the the goofiness at the end. I think the opening for this movie rules, which is why it's as high as it is. I think I, I like the execution of the Spy Who Loved Me is better. The song Moonraker. It's Shirley Bassey. It's John Barry. How can you go wrong? Where are you putting Moonraker on your list? Good question. It's not as good as You Only Live Twice. The Spy Who Loved Me, the theme song for which has already exited <laughs> my head. That was Nobody Does It Better. From Russia With Love is just From Russia With Love. See, I don't have You Only Live Twice very high on my list is the thing. No, neither do I. It's, it's pretty low. I think it goes, man, how much do I hate this song? <laughs> <laughs> I like this song less than I like From Russia With Love, which I wow. actually now want to retcon my... I actually think I should have put From Russia With Love above The Spy Who Loved Me, but this this is going in right at the bottom of the Eon Productions movies that actually have titles. <laughs> That's so, amazing. Yeah. I am not quite so hard on it. I've mentioned that, you know, ballads are going to be at my bottom and that this to me is sort of like starts out sounding like it's going to be a belter especially because it's Shirley Bassey and then it ends up being a ballad and I'm tr I'm trying to figure out I'm going to put it just below the other Shirley Bassey I'm putting it below Diamonds Are Forever but ahead of Look of Love hmm. so it's it's higher for for me we're, we're gonna have to put this somewhere so people can keep up with it I've got Live and Let Die, Goldfinger, OHMSS, Man with the Golden Gun, Thunderball, Diamonds, Moonraker. Yeah, we, we should share this with Matt. Ah, so that he can put that. And then he can find a way to include a graphic That's a good idea. in the video itself yeah. for each of these That's rankings. That's a good idea. Where on that list will the actual movie of Moonraker fall for you? Man, I don't know objectively speaking this movie is not very good <laughs> it's not honestly it's really like, not it barely holds together i think we you know we talked last time about how the spy who loved me hits the notes just right for me where it's like silly and over the top but it doesn't go too far this movie vaults past that line but i still kind of love it <laughs> despite myself i know it's dumb and bad but i like it <laughs> <laughs> I just want to gently shake every character by the shoulders and be like, but why? Yeah. It's like, I'm doing this. Why? Now I'm going over here to do this. But why? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. This one might go above You Only Live Twice for me, which would make it my seventh highest so far um, behind From Russia With Love, Honor Majesty's Secret Service, The Spy Who Loved Me, Live and Let Die, Doctor No. It might go above You Only Live Twice. Only because it's so much fun. <laughs> I'm going to be... I love fun and silly, and there are so many things in this movie that I do deeply enjoy, but I'm going to be a lot harsher on it just because it is so, so... Yeah, man, I don't know. I'm really struggling with this one. I'm currently putting this one ninth on my list. I'm going to put this... I'm going to put Moonraker. I've got Live and Let Die, OHMSS, From Russia With Love, Goldfinger, Golden the Gun, Spy Who Loved Me, Doctor No, You Only Live Twice, Moonraker. Yeah. Thunderball, Diamonds, and the movie of which we dare not speak. Yeah. I... You know what? I have to go with my heart. I have to go with what my heart says on exactly. this one. Exactly. And that is straight up... I think this movie is more fun than You Only Live Twice. I think it's a straight up worse movie. No question it's a worse movie, but I think if I had to sit down and watch one of them tomorrow, I think I I think I want to watch this one. It's just so entertaining. I mean, audiences agreed with you, right? Not until not until yeah. Goldeneye would one be so financially successful, which makes me a little worried for our next four episodes. I don't know. I I will probably want to take that back next episode, but <laughs> but uh, that's where I'm putting it now. I'm putting it behind Dr. No ahead of You Only Live Toys. All right. Well, do you think it will be next episode that you want to change your rankings when we talk about For Your Eyes Only? I literally have no idea that movie doesn't exist in my brain. No, it's a complete cipher. It's a complete cipher to me as well. I do not remember it at all. Couldn't name the co-star, the bad guy, what happens. I think the co-star is nope. Greek. Yeah, she's Greek. Her parents were archaeologists. Okay. She's an archaeologist. Something to do with archaeology in Greece. Oh, he goes diving. Yes. He meets her underwater. Oh, God. No, no. Hang on. That's Thunderball. Oh, right. There is diving, though, in Greece. Yes. I do remember yes. that. The thing I remember is the 
the figure skating prodigy. Is that for your eyes only? Oh, yeah. Oh. Sure is. That's uncomfortable. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's literally the only part I oh, remember. Oh, no, no. The monastery up on top of the cliff. I'm Okay, it's all coming back to me. It's all coming back to me. <laughs> Oh, no. Is this the one with the monastery on top of the cliff? Because I would have sworn to you up and down that that was Living Daylights. But now that I've said that, I know for a fact that it's not Living Daylights. <laughs> okay, maybe this movie rules. <laughs> well, let's... F <laughs> I vaguely recall that the, the intent for For Your Eyes Only was to steer back into gritty realism. Oh, good. To an extent like relative to Moonraker, like it was an, it was a correction from how silly this movie was. And so they were trying to be a little like more grim dark, but good. Yeah. I don't remember much about this movie, but if, if it's the one with the, the, like the big climactic scene at the top of the cliff, I'm now super gunned for next week. All right. Well, same time next week. Let's do it. Yeah, all right. Cool. Yeah. Well, until then I want to thank featherweight for doing the wonderful art. I want to thank Matt Griffiths for all his hard work on the video versions of this. Thank you, Matt so much for joining me and for doing this podcast with me. Always. It's so much fun. Shout outs to Heather for doing podcast admin. Everything that we do is brought to you by you and your kind support of our Patreon at patreon.com slash loading ready run and that is going to do it for moonraker until next time this podcast will return mm -hmm.